morning, everybody. No, well, maybe. Good morning. There we go. Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the March 26, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caffet. Here. McPherson. Here. And Chair Coonerty. Here. And uh, we're going to have a moment of silence and uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, but I'm going to ask my colleague uh, to make a remembrance of a, of a loss in our community. You bet. Uh, Rita Eichhorn passed away. Uh, she had a wonderful life, 91 years. Uh, she was a wonderful woman, and uh, she'll be greatly missed. Thank you. Palacios, are there any changes or deletions to our agenda? Uh, yes, we have a, uh, a few corrections. On the regular agenda, uh, item number nine, there's additional materials. There's a replacement attachment B, which is the packet page 28. And then on item 16, there's additional materials, a revised attachment D, replacement page 221. And then on the consent agenda, item 21, there's additional materials, a revised attachment A, uh, packet pages 261, 262, and 269. And then item 71, uh, staff requests uh, that this item be deleted at the current time. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any uh, items that the board members would like to pull from the consent agenda? Supervisor Caput? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we are now uh, coming up uh, on public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are not on today's agenda but are within the jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. There you, can all, you can also speak to items on the consent agenda, which are items 21 through 76, as well as uh, the regular agenda, if you cannot stay, and the closed session agenda. So uh, please, if you would like to speak today, please line up. Um, you'll be given three minutes. Uh, hi there, uh, Chair Coonerty and honorable, honorable members of the board. Uh, my name is Dan Turbyfill. I reside at 2055 Summit Road in Watsonville. <clears throat> I spent the last 25 years working in the public sector. I worked with the city of Manhattan Beach down in Southern California. I worked with the town of Gilbert during the fastest, it was the fastest growing municipality in the decade I was there. I worked with the city of Phoenix and most re recently I was a faculty associate at Arizona State University. I now serve as a consultant representing numerous small cannabis farmers here in Santa Cruz and in Mendocino County. I believe we are dealing with the most complex and complicated public policy of our time with substantial financial implications. Two weeks ago, I spoke with gratitude uh, <clears throat> for the letter you were sending to the state providing some tax relief. After we left that meeting, we went to the cannabis office to check on the status of our pre-application so we can plan our season. Our project is very straightforward with simple temporary hoop houses and what we believe will actually improve our environment through regenerative farming, which <coughs> much like the farm I managed in Mendocino County, where we actually had the Board of Supervisors come and witness a fully functioning commercial cannabis farm. We saw Sam and met with Mike, who by the way, has been very professional and such a pleasure to work with. Mike mentioned he still had about four to five weeks left for review, and the planning and building could take up to six to eight months. I was shocked as I realized we might not have a crop this year. Mike asked what was my worst case scenario for our farm, and I basically said we won't have plants in the ground. He said you should plan for that. So I met with my team and we discussed a creative way to coordinate <coughs> or to continue to be employed this year. This is catastrophic to us. We're trying hard to come into compliance. 
In Mendocino, we've already purchased our clones from a licensed nursery and we're moving forward with our crop as we work to transition our temporary state license to a provisional license. It's incredibly hard for us to be sitting on the sign lines here in Santa Cruz as other farmers are putting seeds in the ground and gearing up for their season. This process has unequivocally failed us this year for those of us working to participate in the regulated market. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos, and I hope you're really listening to this. He's not the only one out there, and if you want to do your best to discourage the black market, you really need to try to work with these people that have come forward and given you money, and it's the money that this county is relying on to meet the tsunami of debt for the CalPERS pension unfunded debt. Well, I'm here to speak with you this morning about um, First of all, saying that I still do not see the citizen correspondence that I have in the past seen at the back of your agenda packets. I see agendas of other commissions, but I used to see uh, communication that citizens had sent to the board published. I'm not seeing that anymore, and that concerns me. Some of it is mine. <laughs> I also want to say that you have effectively, with your new policies that Mr. Palacio put in place, you've, ef you've effectively reduced the amount of public input time to one third of what it has been in the past, and I protest that. What I come to talk with you about this morning is, um, first of all, in consent agenda item number 58, um, the agreement to extend Hydrometrics Water Resources contract for the uh, Mid-County Groundwater Basin Modeling. Um, I have spoken with you that I am taking legal action against SoCal Creek Water District for their Pure Water SoCal project, a, a faulty EIR and a deficient public process. And I want to let you know that I have received, uh, the county is named as a real party and in interest to that because by definition I must, uh, you are named on the notice of determination. I have received notice from um, County Council of Disassociation, but quite frankly, that makes no sense to me when the county is a trustee agency charged with the stewardship of county parks. One of the injection wells would be immediately adjacent to Willowbrook County Park and the tennis court. The county is charged with the public stewardship of county roads. This project would disrupt over a period of two to three years at least six miles of county maintained public roads, and that is uh, granted in the project's overriding consideration statement because the benefit supposedly outweighs the disruption and, and um, environmental damage. The county is responsible for the, um, the sewer, sanitary sewer system that this system would greatly impact and for which Mr. Edler said the Rodeo Basin is currently in overcapacity and that's where the district wants to put this project. So I am not going to take off the county of Santa Cruz as a, a real party in interest because I think it is a disservice to the county and to the people not to at least be kept in the know of what's going on with this very serious and environmentally damaging project. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable members of the board, good morning. Uh, my name is Caitlin Parkos, and it is a privilege to talk in front of you today. Uh, I'm not here to speak for anyone, uh, but I am here to talk in advocacy for some of those who cannot be in attendance today. I work in cannabis consulting for small-scale farmers transitioning into the legal market, and I hope that it is known that our agricultural model in the United States and California, regardless of what you grow, really doesn't favor small-scale anything. Uh, if it's, it's big, big, big bigness, and if you don't have it, you need to find your niche elsewhere. But unlike a small-scale vegetable farm, a cannabis farm is required to, uh, by county and state law to jump through hoops that have been described by my colleague just now as catastrophic, bankruptcy-inducing, and complete death sentences to livelihoods. Rooted in this preconceived notion that if you work in this industry, you're ranking in a lot of money. Uh, but these are the people that I work with, and they are the reason that I'm here today. Good, hardworking stewards of the land, environmentalists and activists, taxpayers, soccer moms, literally coaching fathers, uh, voters, truly contributing members to all of our communities. Their eyes aren't seeing dollar sign dreams, but college funds for their children, fire protection for their homes because they tend to live outskirts of town, 
and retirement from when their body, bodies finally give way to the immense lifetime of labor. I am here to remind you that these are the faces of the cannabis industry that we see every single day. The very people who are being forgotten about are not invited to the conversation when we assume that an equity tax or thousands of dollars worth of fees means nothing to this quote unquote mega billion dollar industry. We do predict exponential opportunity and economic success and astronomical revenue when the media mentions cannabis. But in my researched opinion, the very reason California has yet to see any of these expectations is because of these insurmountable hurdles that we have put in place for the massive network of small scale farmers who up to this point have set the foundation for the cannabis industry's success. I mean, where do we honestly believe that we've pulled this data of these expectations? I'm asking you respectfully to not let yourself be caught up in ignorance and see the devastating effects that these hurdles are having on our communities and this industry. And I'll do the same in recognizing that you and other governing members of the board might already be on our side or uh, having this conversation. The history of cannabis in this country is long, tumultuous, fear-bogged, genuinely fascinating, and generally misunderstood. Our current situation proves its complexity and the ease of which we all get caught up in the frustration, but we got to this very moment of you up there and me over here having a conversation about this plant, and that alone is in a victory. But we can all do better. I applaud your movement and support on the issues in the past, but I encourage you to not lose sight of the incredible benefits of deschedulizing cannabis. I know your hands are tied and that you have reasonable working to loosen the strains on lacked resources, but you can do better. The farmers I work with can, and so can I. It's an absolute honor to work for these farmers, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sheila Delaney, 5th District. Um, I'm mostly here with the Women's Commission to help celebrate the Trailblazers this morning, but I'd also like to speak to you as president of the Valley Women's Club and one of the directors of the Recyc Redemption Recycling Centers in the Valley. As you know by now, I hope the Valley Women's Club will not be bidding on a contract for recycling. Um, but there is a lot of misinformation and misinterpretation of information out there that I would like to ask your help about. The recycling is going away in our sites, Ben Lomond, or Felton and Boulder Creek, as is the redemption of bottles, cans that have redemption value at all three sites. Ben Lomond Transfer Station will continue recycling and for a redemption value, you have to go back to the stores where you bought it after June 30th. We'll be in business until June 30th. So please, I'm asking you to direct Public Works to make signage and publicity that that lets people know what's right. I, I keep talking to people who say, oh, we'll be able to, no more, no more recycling, but we'll be able to redeem our bottles and cans. That's exactly backwards, so I hope you can help us with that. Um, the other issue that I'd like to ask your patience on is that because we have a lot of heavy equipment at the Ben Lomond transfer site, it will take us a while to get rid of the equipment, sell it off, and clean up the site to the standards it needs to be, and the one day between June 30th and July 1st isn't really quite enough time. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, my name is Tony Crane, representing uh, the Estates Boregas neighborhood in Aptos regarding the second story program. Uh, on July 7th, 2017, the county and Encompass Community Services closed on a house using a grant uh, to house a short stay uh, crisis mental health facility in a residential neighborhood. The the grant specifically mandated that they increase bed capacity by two to eight beds. When we found out about this after the close, several weeks after the close, we requested a meeting. Uh, on August 21st, 2017, we had a meeting with county and Encompass employees on the dais, and they uh, told us three distinct lies at that point in time. That they had no intention of going to eight beds at that time, that there was no licensing required, and that they had a two-year extension by law to bring this to fruition. Um, I think uh, legally that's called creating a false pretense. 
So when we realized that they were not telling the truth, we got their emails, and I'm gonna read a couple of emails for you today. So um, Eric Riera was on the dais that day and told us that they didn't have to go to eight beds and that there was no licensing required. Here's a message from one of the Encompass employees uh, telling everybody Eric Riera's direction. Quote, Eric Riera's direction on this is to complete the purchase and move a max of six people into the house over time during the first year without a big public announcement and use that first year to establish good relationships with the neighbors, establish trust and a track record and then go through the process with planning to license and licensing to then convert the house to a social rehab for eight residents during the second year. The, mandate, the grant also mandates that if it ever becomes anything other than a uh, pure respite, uh, that it, the money needs to be forfeited and sent back. So this was June 29th, eight days before the close of escrow, and they are planning to not meet the terms of the grant because they knew they never could. That is a direct quote from Eric Riera. They lied to us. Then regarding licensing, he also said, that somebody had brought up the, the possibility of creating a new license for something like this because the license didn't exist. Quote, Eric Riera, to create a new licensing category, I recap the history of how we got to the licensing requirement and that yes, it was a condition of the grant, specifically around expanding bed capacity. I did not go into the other options that we had discussed in the event we were not able to license. So they, those lies were particularly told to us to avoid legal scrutiny and they need to be brought to justice and that program needs to be removed from our neighborhood. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, honorable members of the board. Uh, my name is Najib Kamil. I'm a senior analyst with Family and Children's Services um, in the Human Services Department. And I'm gonna just read a proclamation on Child Abuse uh, Prevention Month, which is April. But before I do that, I just wanted to thank you all for all the work and initiatives that you do in the community to address and prevent child abuse and neglect, as well as uh, thank the uh, Family and Children's Services staff, as well as Human Services staff who do this work every day to prevent uh, child abuse from happening, as well as preventing it from happening again. And lastly, I wanna thank the community for all the work that they do in terms of helping and supporting the families that are in crisis that can uh, prevent child abuse and neglect. Um, the reason why this proclamation is being uh, done is because April, as I said, is uh, Child Abuse and Prevention uh, Month. It's National Child Abuse and Prevention Month. And um, this issue of child abuse and neglect is larger than just one agency to hold, and it really is to energize the community, the agencies who work with our families to make sure that we are doing all that we can to prevent uh, this from happening. And so I'm gonna read the proclamation Pro proclaiming April 2019 as National Child Abuse Prevention Awareness Month in the County of Santa Cruz, whereas over 2,500 cases of child abuse are investigated in Santa Cruz County every year, and whereas Family and Children's Services of Santa Cruz County works with more than 300 children and youth and their families every year, and whereas every community has a stake in the safety, permanency, and well-being of its children, and by promoting and supporting programs and services that provide resources for children and families, the community can be effective in preventing child abuse and neglect. And whereas effective child abuse prevention hinges on open and communication, collaboration, and partnership among agencies, schools, religious organizations, law enforcement agencies, the business community, and community members, and whereas Child Abuse Prevention Month has been observed each April since its first presidential proclamation in 1983, and since that time, individuals, organizations, and communities across the country have participated in this critical campaign to increase awareness of child maltreatment and the importance of prevention. Whereas the child abuse is preventable and unacceptable, and we can all play a role in helping our community better understand child abuse prevention by supporting programs and services that help families and children 
and community members supporting families by donating new and used children's clothing, furniture, and toys for families, being kind and supportive to new parents, responding to families in crisis, and linking families to needed services and opportunities. Now, therefore, I, Bruce McPherson, Santa Cruz County 5th District Supervisor, hereby declare the month of April 2018 as a National Child Abuse Prevention Month in the County of Santa Cruz and commend Family and Children's Services for its service to local children. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your work in our community. <laughs> so uh, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for action on the consent agenda, which is our items 21 uh, through 76, with the exception of number 71. Uh, on consent, yes. So, Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have some brief comments on consent. First, I'd like to thank you for bringing forward item on the 47 regarding the Health Services Agency staff to study the banning of sale of flavored tobacco and nicotine products. I think that this is an important thing to consider for our community. On item 67, I appreciate the work of Public Works regarding uh, the potential options for financing. I recognize you're going to come back in June. I recognize the time issues associated with it. Uh, I am hopeful that once you meet with the RTC, it will be possible we'll find that we can bond so that we can ex expedite some of the funding for local roads that are so desperately needed. And on item 73, which is the La Selva Beach project, I just wanted to thank Ms. Lindbergh and all the uh, Public Works staff on that. It's moving along very Nicely, the community in La Selva Beach is very excited about the possibilities of what will be with that new library, and I'm looking forward to it as well. I just appreciate that you've kept it front and center and that you're moving it forward. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple items to comment on. On uh, item uh, number 56, it was a deferral uh, about a report on reducing the number of people held in jail. This is our second deferral, so I'm hoping that uh, when we get this back next time, we have good information, including the concurrence rate of our judiciary with our probation-led uh, uh, pretrial effort. I think that's a critically important for us in terms of reducing the number of people held in jail with the risk assessment tool that we have. Um, on uh, item number 68, which is a Live Oak parking uh, program, uh, we are in the midst of uh, uh, negotiations with the Coastal Commission about updating this program, so this is just we're going to uh, play by the, almost the same rules as uh, we did in uh, uh, last year. There's a modest increase in the, in the cost of permits, uh, but I'm assured that we're going to have the staffing this year to be able to support that program, and I look forward to, uh, to the continuation of that program after we get support from the Coastal Commission. Um, I think that's all I have. Supervisor so McPherson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. A um, uh, couple of four items. Uh, number 34 on gun violence I support, and I think we all will be supporting uh, the piece of legislation to further limit um, access to firearms for people with gun violence restraining orders. We need to strengthen those protection. I'm glad we're taking this action to support these uh, pieces of legislation in, uh, in Sacramento. On item number uh, 61, the state's early childhood investments, uh, I'd like to thank our uh, Human Service uh, Director, Ellen Timber Timberlake, and the uh, Human Services Department for bringing forward this letter of support of the state's early childhood investments. Uh, the more we invest in our children early, the better we're going to be in the, the future. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership with the Thrive by Three here in Santa Cruz County to serve one of our most vulnerable, vulnerable populations. On uh, item number six, uh, 66, I uh, was very pleased to see us return Bear Creek Road to its pre-disaster conditions. This is a vital link, not only to the residents in the Boulder Creek and San Lorenzo Valley area, area in general, but the, to the commuter commuters that uh, travel that roadway. Uh, to see that slip out that happened there is unbelievable that you could even bring it back to working order, so to speak. It was. Um, Quite a, quite a slide, and I'm glad to see it's back in, in place. Um, and on, uh, to repeat, on item 67, I'm, I'm glad to see that, uh, uh, to, to support the effort to determine whether we can bond ag against Measure G revenue for looking at our, uh, our ways to uh, improve our roads that were so damaged uh, so seriously. I want to thank, um, again, Supervisor Coonerty, Chairman Coonerty, for his suggestion to considering, uh, considering uh, this bonding as a possible measure, um, especially in light of what um, we were hearing some rumors from the federal government of uh, some of their withdrawal of funds, possibly, in essence. But uh, it's very important for our county. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Caput. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. A couple of quick comments. I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Ferris Sabah uh, to the first five commission as an at-large representative for a term <coughs> until 2021. And uh, also item 46, approve the appointment of Robert Tanner to the Pajaro Valley Public Cemetery District Board uh, for a term until 2021. Thank you for their uh, voluntary service. Thank you. And just a couple more comments. Uh, so on, as was mentioned, item number 34, um, I'm recommending that we support three bills that will limit access to guns um, and increase gun safety. And I think it's a small, uh, a series of small steps, um, but we need to address this issue uh, both as a state and as a nation. Um, on item 47, I wanna thank the city of Santa Cruz and Mayor Martin Watkins for bringing forward, forward a flavored tobacco ban in the city. And I'm hoping that the county, uh, through the leadership of the health services agency, will be able to follow suit um, in that way. And I'm, item number 60, this is a small step towards medi uh, medical assisted treatment for opioid uh, addiction. And um, I just, it's, it's in a tremendous crisis that's having an impact on all parts of our community. And I really appreciate the health services agency for uh, moving this forward and, and hopefully um, we can get th this grant and other grant dollars to increase access. On item number 61, I also wanna thank Ellen Timberlake and her team at, at the health services agency. Uh, this county has been a leader in our supporting early childhood programs and family programs. We now have the state uh, catching up and potentially providing resources and it's put us in a very good position to expand opportunities uh, for all young children in our community. And uh, so I wanna th uh, thank everybody and then I'll take a motion. Um, I would move the consent agenda as amended. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Um, we're now moving on to uh, item number seven, which is a uh, presentation honoring Dan Hayfley the, uh, on his retirement from the O'Neill Sea Odyssey. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't often um, have people from outside the county uh, have a special item on their retirement, but Dan has been, played such a pivotal role uh, in this community in so many different ways over the years. Uh, that I'm sure my, my colleagues will talk about, but, um, but we wanted to take a moment to really appreciate everything you've done. I'll say personally, uh, you gave me my first job in Santa Cruz uh, that wasn't boardwalk related. Um, uh, running a school bond campaign where you and Norm Lezen were the chair. Uh, you promised me long hours and low pay and you, you delivered on that promise. Um, but you also taught me the importance of listening to this community, listening listening to leaders and citizens, uh, caring and engaging, and the power of public service uh, to do good. And we won that campaign, and we invested uh, $81 million in public schools, and that's only one small piece of the legacy that you've left uh, in protecting our natural environment, in educating children, in just being a tremendous leader. And so we're, we're truly, truly grateful uh, for your leadership. And I'll. Uh, hand over to my colleagues, and so Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, when we get into our careers, we, uh, at least I think, uh, what can we do uh, to do our part to change the world? And when I look at the career of Dan Hayfley, I think he's done a lot to change the world, especially our corner of the world. Um, as an organizer and leader, he was a, a, a he led the effort uh, around Save Our Shores to protect the coastline from offshore oil drilling. If that had been where he stopped, that would have been enough. Um, but he continued on and he became an educator and he, uh, he helped educate generations of, of children uh, to understand the, uh, the value of our ocean, what goes on in our ocean, how to protect our oceans. Um, that would have been an incredible piece. He's helped record the history of our region uh, with uh, his regular columns in the Santa Cruz Sentinel and the recently published book uh, about uh, 40 years of advocacy uh, for our shores. Um, he's also contributed to the natural environment, not only protecting 
the coastline, but ensuring permanent protection for the Mo Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which he played a tremendous role in, uh, the, the new um, monument on the, on the North Coast. Uh, these are all incredible legacies that if only one of them had been accomplished, they would have been an, uh, a great piece uh, of Santa Cruz history and, uh, and Santa Cruz lore. But uh, to, to have accomplished all those pieces is a career that has uh, been well served to this community and the environment and the people who live here. Um, I'm glad uh, to have uh, worked with Dan in, in different phases of his career. Uh, I'm glad to be able to call him a friend. Um, I'm glad that we've enjoyed the every, music, uh, food, uh, the ocean together. Um, and uh, I wish you to, to have the uh, uh, great success in whatever the next chapter of your life is, even if it's just re relaxing and retiring uh, in, in the beautiful uh, bay that you help uh, protect for so many years. Thank you for all you've done, Dan. Supervisor Prem. And Dan, I, I actually wanted to tell you a personal story about just what happened this last weekend, because I see your legacy through the eyes of, of my four-year-old, who, when we were walking uh, along the beach this weekend, in, in essence, south of, of Aptos, and he was collecting shells. And of course, I brought with me two bags, one for his shells and one because of Cynthia Matthews for all the plastic on the beach. She's known for picking <laughs> up trash everywhere she goes and has trained us to do that. But this is the world that he is growing up in that he didn't necessarily have to grow up in. Uh, a, a totally different path could have been had for this county and for this state, but for your work. He may not uh, necessarily know or understand at this point in his life uh, what political and policy decisions and advocacy decisions were made on his behalf to allow him to have that opportunity. But as I was watching him, and the beach is so much a part of his life and his existence, and his understanding of the natural environment is so much a part of who he is, it really is in large part because of your work. And, and as Supervisor Leopold was saying, you have a remarkable number of accomplishments, but a lot of us go day to day and aren't really sure uh, whether or not what we're doing will have this lasting impact. And, and there's no question through his life, and I know so many other children, uh, children's lives here, you know, that you have made a remarkable difference and impact on this area and on this state, and in some respects on influencing national policy as a result with the creation of the sanctuary. So on his behalf, I just want to thank you. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight to see the world uh, appreciated through a four-year-old's eyes, but he is able to live a more privileged life because of your advocacy work, and I just want to thank you, Dan. Thank you. Dan Hafley, you've heard, he's touched all of our lives, and so many, uh, not just older folks like me, but the youngsters, as uh, Zach said, with his son. Uh, when I first um, got into this political uh, livelihood, so to speak, in my run for assembly, and I was very interested in coastal protection, uh, first person I talked to uh, was Dan Hafley. Uh, he, uh, he knew what was going on then, uh, in 1993, uh, as well as anybody else around here. And uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, I want to tell you that uh, that led to me. It, didn't, was, it was where I was going anyway, but uh, in the offshore oil vote, when I was in the assembly, the 80-member assembly, it was 41 votes, and I was the only one in my caucus to vote for it, to pass by the narrowest of margins. And I want to thank you for the, the, uh, the criticism that I got from my caucus, Dan, I guess I should <laughs> tell you, say, uh, but uh, it became one. It's, uh, it's really been a key component of our coastal protection. And it's people like Dan Hafley that, uh, that really s solidify the need for these types of coastal protection issues. Uh, does it reasonably, sensibly? And as Zach mentioned, our supervisor friend mentioned, uh, he does it to the young people too. I think in his uh, oversight of the O'Neill Sea Odyssey, what has it been 100,000 children, school-aged, um, that have been, had their first sight of going out to the sea and finding out just exactly what's out there and why we need to protect it and how sensitive it is uh, that we make every effort we can to protect that, uh, the ocean front that we have. Um, I think as much as anybody in this state, and probably this, this state, we have Dan Hafley to thank for our coastal uh, pristine area that we have. He's, uh, 
He, and the best part about it, he's just a great person to, to deal with and to be with. Um, I just really uh, consider him a good friend and uh, I really wanna thank you for everything that you have done to help our community and to help the coastline of California. Thank you. Thank you. I, don't, I didn't know the number on uh, students that actually went out on the Sea Odyssey, but when I was on the Watsonville City Council, I went out with uh, McQuitty School one time and then also one time with uh, Minnie White School. And uh, the kids were more excited of, you know, about going out to the sea than they were of getting out of school a little bit for a couple hours. But uh, it was a real learning experience, not only for the kids, but for myself. And uh, I think it's a wonderful program, and I uh, uh, want to thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you. And so um, there's no way that we can adequately thank you for the work that you've done for our community and for our region. Um, but we do have a proclamation here signed by every member of the Board of Supervisors, uh, recognizing many uh, of the, the ways that uh, have been mentioned, of the ways you've impacted the community. Um, and uh, so collectively, we are uh, proclaiming April 11th, because you have to wait till you re actually retire, uh, 2019 is Dan Hafley Day in the county of Santa Cruz. Um, but I think that as you, as the kids walk the beaches, uh, as we uh, educate and have a generation who knows and appreciates uh, what marine life is and ocean protection is, um, every day is Dan Hafley Day in the county of Santa Cruz. I, I would move approval. Okay. So, uh, so actually, hold on. We have to, uh, we have to, we need a, we need a motion. I would uh, move approval of the proclamation. Second. A motion by Leopold and a second uh, by friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously. you so much that really means a lot to me just a couple of brief things I want to say uh, 41 years ago there was a group of eight volunteers uh, including a staffer in your own county planning department Kim Schantz who started an organization called Save Our Shores and they did uh, over 41 years of, uh, of activism by volunteers and others. And then 23 years ago, a man named Jack O'Neill, who started a surf business in San Francisco, moved down the coast of Santa Cruz, uh, decided that he wanted to turn what he had seen as a playground into a classroom, so he started O'Neill's Sea Odyssey. And I think these two things really had their home here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, this county has been a leader for many, many years in environmental protection efforts, led by specifically this Board of Supervisors, each of you individually, the work that has gone into successive efforts uh, to prevent the choking of our ocean through plastic pollution, through the changing of ocean chemistry, through climate change, all of the things that you do every day as a county, as staff, as a board to uh, protect our environment really lead uh, this nation. And this is a time that we really have to have this kind of leadership. So uh, that prov uh, enables people like me and others to uh, do what we do. And uh, it's been a great career. I wanna thank you all for your support, particularly your support of O'Neill Sea Odyssey over these past several years, very generously so. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Dan. 
Uh, we now are gonna move on to item number eight, which is a presentation recognizing the recipients of the Women's uh, Commission Trailblazer Awards. And um, this is uh, an annual award given by our Women's Commission, which is an advisory body uh, to the board that to, is, exists to advance the causes of all women, expand possibilities for women and girls, and advocate for empowerment and equality. Uh, it's a remarkable group of uh, women, and uh, who, both who are on the commission and who they've chosen to honor today. 10 nominations were received by the Women's Commission for these awards, and we'll be recognizing four of these nominees as Santa Cruz County Trailblazers. The commissioners used a strict rating system to review each nomination, as well as the applicant's eligibility and impact. Those who have made extraordinary differences uh, in the lives of women and girls by serving as innovative leaders or pioneers have been selected as trailblazers. We will now present the Trailblazer Awards. We will introduce our commissioners and Trailblazer Award winners and have them approach the, the podium. Our uh, commissioners will each give a summary of the Trailblazers awardees um, and accomplishments uh, and uh, Supervisor Leopold will introduce our first Trailblazer Award winner. Uh, thank you, Chair Coonerty. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Women's Commission for their ongoing hard work in uh, recognizing the needs of women and, and girls in Santa Cruz County. And it's very exciting uh, for this annual awards presentation, the Trailblazers Award. I am constantly amazed by the powerful women we have in our community who are contributing to the health and success of so many uh, families in our community. Um, I'd like to invite Commissioner Teresa Carino uh, and Trailblazer Margaret Carino Condon to come up to the podium. Buenos dias, good morning. Thank you, board members, community members, family and friends, and of course, thank you to our many trailblazers here today. I think it's important that we are here today recognizing extraordinary women who are lifting up other women and girls in our community. We've come a long way, but there is still work to be done. With that said, I am proud to represent the Women's Commission District 1, and I am beyond honored to give this award to my sister, Margaret Carino Condon. Margaret is the co-founder and program coordinator of Salud y Cariño, a local nonprofit promoting overall health and wellness for middle school girls through physical activity and social emotional support at a critical time in their development. She is also a facilitator for our program, serving girls fifth through eighth grade in Live Oak. In 2015, she helped pilot our first program with just 17 sixth grade girls. Now in 2019, she has touched the lives of over 400 girls. Margaret has also been a member of the Institute for Women Surfers since 2015 and is currently a surf instructor with the Wahini Project, an organization that strives to reduce barriers and increase access to the ocean and surfing for all girls. Margaret loves being able to spread the stoke through the work she does with each of these organizations and envisions Salud y Cariño's programs reaching all girls in Santa Cruz County and beyond. Lastly, I think there are two kinds of trailblazers. There's the ones that are out in the front, making a lot of noise, with a huge visible presence, and others quietly working in the background. Margaret is the latter. She is the strong yet gentle force, sometimes not so gentle, <laughs> pushing forward. She is opening doors, blazing a trail, and helping others find their way one girl at a time. I'm proud to present this award to my sister, Margaret Carino Condon. Our next, uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Commissioner Maggie Barr to approach the podium. I'd also like to welcome Trailblazer Casey Coonerty Prati uh, to come to the front. 
As owner of Bookshop Santa Cruz, Casey is committed to diversity and Bookshop Santa Cruz features books with many viewpoints, including a specific emphasis on giving females authors a spot in the limelight. At Bookshop Santa Cruz, Casey creates a Women's Voices campaign, created a Women's Voices campaign designed not only to feature women authors, but also to stimulate a community conversation around women's <laughs> issues. In 2017, Casey organized a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood called Read and Rights to support women's health care rights in Santa Cruz County, raising $33,000 and sending 260 postcards to elected officials in support of these rights. Casey has been instrumental in creating the Alliance of Women Entrepreneurs, or AWE, in downtown Santa Cruz with the goal of creating community in the downtown area by shining a light on the unique leadership and community building strength of the local women business owners. Casey is a role model for women and girls and leads by example, giving women a prominent place in our cultural conversation, which inspires and encourages all of us. I'd like to present this certificate to you, Casey, for all of your dedication and contribution to women in Santa Cruz County. And I so, believe Craig Capult has a certificate for you. So as yeah, well. and I just actually I'm, I'm going to present. Okay, this one. come on uh, down, right? The privilege <laughs> of the chair, <laughs> Supervisor Coonerty. Thank you. Um, and I just want to briefly um, say, so this is uh, Casey's my sister, uh, and um, I had nothing to do with this award. Uh, Kate McGrew in the uh, Women's Commission's office called and wanted to nominate her just by seeing the impact she's having in the community. It's incredibly, incredibly well deserved. Um, my dad and I tend to take up a lot of the attention in the family, but uh, Casey is getting by far the most done. Um, I know she she worries all night about the world, about her family, about this community, and then she gets up every morning and gets things done. And so uh, it's my pleasure to, sign, to give you this proclamation. And it's the, I've signed many proclamations over the years. The first one I've gotten to write, I love you on, uh, <laughs> uh, when I did. <laughs> Now, Zach. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. I'd like to invite Commissioner Jillian Ritter to approach the podium, and I'd also like to invite Trailblazer Award winnie, uh, awardee Nicole Keedel to come to the front. Um, so I'm just gonna say <clears throat> a few words about the amazing accomplishments Nicole has um, accomplished over the past several years. Um, Nicole has worked with criminal justice involved women as a leader, advocate, and role model in Santa Cruz County for more than five years. Nicole's courage to speak publicly about her past experiences with addiction, incarceration, and healing inspires other women to believe that they too can transform their lives. As a manager of a woman's sober, sober living environment, Nicole worked to support women during their recovery journey and has helped many women navigate the reentry process, returning to the community after incarceration. Nicole also ran a public speaking class called the Speakers Bureau for formerly incarcerated individuals. She made a point of making sure that women felt welcome and empowered in this co-ed class and has been able to connect personally with women across class, race, and ethnicity and inspire them to heal through storytelling. Nicole is a full-time mom, a full-time student, and also currently works full-time as an employment specialist, providing support to help people gain meaningful employment, stability, and self-sufficiency. Nicole is also an active representative on the Advisory Task Force on Justice and Gender, and has helped to provide task force recommendations to the Board of Supervisors in order to help identify safe, supportive, and affordable housing sites and options for criminal justice involved women and families. Um, I could go on and on about Nicole's great accomplishments, um, but I just want to say thank you, Nicole, for everything that you've done for women and girls in our community. You really deserve it. Yeah. It's a uh, certificate from us. Thank you so much.
and a proclamation. Thank you. And Supervisor McPherson will be introducing our final Trailblazer awardee. Thank you, Chair Coonerty. I'd like to invite Commissioner Teresa Carino to approach the podium. And I'd also like to invite Trailblazer awardee Clara Miner to come up front. And just as a warning, I wanna let you know that uh, Clara has been teaching uh, fitness through uh, <coughs> young ladies and uh, elderly ones as well, three through 75 as I read it, uh, through martial arts, so you don't wanna miss. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> she's, uh, she's been a terrific advocate for women's rights and self-defense. Awesome. I met Clara um, in 2014, 2015, so I also know her personally. Clara has been empowering women and girls ages three to 75 in Santa Cruz community for more than 33 years through martial arts, fitness, and as you said, self-defense. Her training goes beyond training to fight and incorporates verbal skills, intuitive training, and mental strategies. Her techniques have helped women of all ages experience emotional ease and increased confidence. Clara's self-defense workshops are offered to the community free of charge and uniquely address the needs for women to feel safe and strong in any life situation. I know this because she also did a self-defense class for our after-school girls. Women who work with Clara learn to appreciate their bodies, their inner and outer strength, and their potential because Clara believes in them and offers the opportunity to take that belief on for themselves. Claire is an active community member and shows up every day with the intention of helping others through her work and community support. She always has a smile. You can't miss the smile. She always has a smile on her face and genuinely cares for this community, and I'm honored to present this Trailblazer Award to Claire Miner. I just wanna say a quick thank you to the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission, to Robin Holland, who's sitting back right there, and Monica Karst, who nominated me. And I'm honored to be with these other four women for Trailblazer 2019. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you to, thank you to the Women's Commission and thank you uh, to our four uh, trailblazers who are really making our community a better place. Uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute recess uh, to, to join you all uh, for a reception in the Redwood Conference Room, which is just out here to the right, uh, and to thank you for your service. And then we'll, we'll be back at 10 to continue on our agenda. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So let's uh All right, I'm going to I'm going to call the meeting back to order. Uh, and we're gonna hear uh, item number nine, which is a public hearing to consider the 2018 general plan annual report as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. 
Yeah, Mr. Carlson here to present. Thank you, uh, David Carlson from the Planning Department. And each year the Planning Department prepares an annual report on the general plan amendments that have proce been processed in the previous year, um, expected future general plan amendments, um, status of major programs in the general plan, and status of implementation of the housing element. Um, in 2018, the board considered two general plan amendments re uh, related to uh, regulation of commercial cannabis and the Nissan dealership project. In 2019, we expect to process additional general plan amendments related to supporting affordable housing, um, general plan amendments related to the sustainability policy and uh, regulatory update, uh, beginning with the EIR process on that, and uh, general plan amendments related to the safety and noise element and uh, land use near the Watsonville airport. The housing element part of the uh, report summarizes applications and permits for new housing units in 2018 in data tables provided by the state. In table B um, summarizes um, our overall progress in meeting our regional housing needs um, allocation. And there's a revised table B which adds in some additional data from uh, the year 2014. Um, and Table D uh, summarizes the status of implementation of housing element programs intended to meet our housing goals. Uh, staff is recommending that the Board of Supervisors conduct a public hearing on the 2018 General Plan Annual Report, accept and file this report, and direct the Planning Director to submit the report to the State um, Office of Planning and Research and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And I'm available for questions along with other members of the Planning Department staff. Sure, so why don't we start and see if we have any questions. Let me make a comment. Sure. Uh, thank you for your effort uh, on this progress report. It's, uh, well, we need to do it, we have to do it, but I, uh, I'm paying particular attention to um, how we're uh, progressing on our housing situation, um, and I just want to see that um, some um, interest is particularly in the amendments that refer to um, a school employee housing, farm worker housing, um, permanent room housing provisions, um, just so that's what uh, is really caught my eye or what I'm most interested at this point in, in our update. Um, I think it's that we need to have, create and maintain a more affordable options as we all, and that's hard to, to reach. And I think our affordable housing here in Santa Cruz County, unfortunately, is probably a little different from most other counties. But uh, thank you for your efforts in this. And uh, we have a tremendous need here and I appreciate this report. Um, look forward to it coming back to us. Thank you. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I appreciate this uh, annual report that we get, and it's a good um, look at uh, all the different efforts that are going on, especially as we look around the housing uh, pieces. Um, and one of the items, um, uh, Program 4.12, which is uh, maintain the vacation rental ordinance, um, one of the things I realize uh, has fallen off and I'd like to, to, I'll be adding on as an additional direction is to get an annual report about uh, the vacation rentals um, and to get a sense of how close we are to reaching our limits in the different designated areas. I think that's very important. Um, the board has, has tried to uh, uh, find some limits uh, to the use of vacation homes or vacation rooms. And it's good to, to have an idea of how close we are to, to these uh, limits. It's also good for the community to know. Um, I also, uh, I appreciate all the different uh, efforts uh, that have been going on. And I think that, uh, I know for one of the R combining sites, which is discussed in here, uh, in Soquel, there has been a lot, of, uh, there's been a renewed interest in actually developing that parcel. Um, and I think that uh, once the uh, water issues could be dealt with in uh, SoCal that we'll see activity on the Erlac site um, because that, that has uh, proven to be the reason why we can't develop that site. The, the owners are finally interested in, in working with people on that. So uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the near future that we'll be able to see some activity there. Thank you for your work. Thank you. All right, uh, now we're gonna open it up to members of the public for uh, comments. Please come forward. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Thank you for the staff report and for the information in the packet. Um, I am curious because I was at the planning commission hearing when the commission reviewed this. Um, I see that the table B of regarding the RENA numbers and reports of those 
The numbers, as you said, for 2015 were uh, revised substantially <laughs> from 62 to 121. So um, the commission did not see those numbers and I'm a little concerned about that um, because that did address one of their um, recommendations to the board that there has been historically a uh, preponderance of um, affordable housing for above moderate income with very little going out to very low and, and low income brackets. And um, that is part of the commission's uh, recommendation to the board today that that be addressed. I also um, want to second the commission's, the plan commission's request that the database of all rental housing um, types in the county regarding cost and vacancies be updated and be collected. And there was discussion about that at the Planning Commission hearing, uh, how staffing is, is always a challenge, but that kind of information will give us, the you, the decision makers, the information that you need. And, and Supervisor Leopold, I wanna thank you for your request to have an update on the vacation rental numbers. Another recommendation the County Planning Commission gave was that they wanted to track the demolition of housing um, in housing element program 4.4. Um, as one who also attends County Historic Preservation uh, Resources meeting, I want to ask that there be special consideration and uh, additional requirements made on any properties scheduled for demolition that have historic significance, cultural significance, and that this county adopts a Mills Act to really help owners of significant uh, cultural and historic properties to maintain them rather than just demolish them. And along with uh, Supervisor Leopold's comment about the um, our combining um, property, the Nye property, and the Kaiser uh, new use proposed, um, that was to be 102 units of affordable housing. It bothers me that the planning department is allowing the Kaiser developers to choose where those units would go and would allow them to be uh, split up among multiple sites. That's ad hoc planning and I would like the board to address that. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one, I'm gonna close public comment and bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. With the, with the additional direction from Supervisor Leopold regarding the annual reporting on vacation rentals. Uh, and if we could just have that back uh, by budget hearings, I think that would be great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, motion by friend, second, second by McPherson. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Uh, Let's, we have a scheduled uh, public hearing uh, at 10.30, so. Uh, <laughs> I need to move to, <laughs> possibly move to item 11, I think, yeah. quickly. Why don't we move to item 11? 11, 11, 12, and 13. 11, 12, and 13. And we'll come back to, uh, to item number 10 after the zone five and zone seven hearings. I'm assuming item 11 is the Coastal Commission mods? Correct. Yeah, did you read that in? Did oh, sorry, I guess I should read. Uh, <laughs> yes, a public <laughs> hearing uh, to consider accepting Coastal Commission modifications to the recent amendments to regulations regarding the regional housing needs are combining zone districts affecting county code sections 13.10.170D and 13.10476B and D as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director, and we have Ms. Levine here to present. Good morning. Your board uh, recently approved amendments to the Regional Housing Needs Overlay District to help support the creation of affordable housing. The Coastal Commission certified those amendments on March 6th. However, they certified them conditional on two modifications being accepted by your board. The modifications emphasize that any application in the coastal zone does require a planned unit development permit and that that planned unit development permit is also a local coastal plan amendment 
subject to approval by the Coastal Commission. They also wanted us to make more clear in the code that the overlay may only be applied to commercial property that is zoned C1, C2, or PA. The staff supports the changes as clarifications, and our recommendation is that your board um, uh, accept those modifications. The formal recommendation is to hold a public hearing on the Coastal Commission proposed modifications to 1310.170D, 1310.476B and D, adopt the resolution accepting each modification, and direct the planning director to submit the board's acceptance to the executive director of the Coastal Commission for a finding that the board's acceptance has been accomplished. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Pretty straightforward. Seeing none, are there any public comments? Good morning again, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I was at the plan County Planning Commission hearing when this issue came before them and they delayed it. They have not seen or considered, to my understanding, um, these Coastal Commission modifications. And that was because they came in really the day before, the night before, the morning of their hearing to consider them. So I would like to ask you, because I really respect the level of uh, scrutiny and thoughtfulness that the Planning Commission always lends these issues that come before them, I would like to ask you that you delay action on this until the Planning Commission does indeed get a chance to review the modifications proposed by the Coastal Commission to your board. Um, this re requires that, um, uh, it points out that there could be um, a comp that the discretion of the Board of Supervisors and the Commission in the way that it was written could be compromised. Uh, the Planning Commission and there did not get a chance to hear that and consider that publicly. And this directly affects um, that it must have an LCP amendment as a uh, planned unit development. Um, this issue is coming before you soon in a, a a public hearing regarding the seascape um, estates proposed PUD. So um, it also says that you must have a finding that the uh, project is consistent with the LCP under code 13.10.215 section D and that there would be no adverse impacts on coastal resources. So to me as a citizen, these are significant modifications proposed by the Coastal Commission that have not been publicly considered by this county's planning commissioners, and I really respect them. I respect you as well, but I think it would behoove the, this process to uh, have it go uh, before the planning commission and be very thoroughly vetted publicly. Thank you very much. Thank you, that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. I just question, uh, I ask council, um, we can take action on this on this recommendation from the Coastal Commission, we're not required to go to the Planning Commission. Is that My accurate? understanding from what Ms. Levine said is that they're not significant modifications, they're clarifications, so I don't have any basis to, to um, suggest that you would return to the Planning Commission at this point. Yeah, they, they, they actually seem to increase the amount of public scrutiny when you have to do a local coastal plan amendment. Also, just to clarify, you, you needed to have the coastal, it, it just wasn't clear enough for the Coastal Commission that the coastal plan amendment is required. It was in the code previously and they wanted it reiterated, so it's not a change in that way. Uh, I would move the recommended actions. Motion by Leopold. Second, Second by McPherson. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Let's move on to item number 12, which is to consider final appointment of Larry Pegler to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan District as, as an at-large representative for a term to expire on December 31st, 2020. I would move approval. Uh, got a motion, a uh, second. Is there any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. A motion by Leopold and a second by McPherson. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. 
on item number 13, which is consider final appointments to various uh, persons for reappointment to at-large positions, to the Childhood Advisory Council, the Environmental Health Appeals Commission, the First Five Commission, the Hazardous Materials Advisory Commission, the In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Commission, the Mental Health Advisory Board, the Santa Cruz, Monterey, Merced, Vantage Care Commission, and the Water Advisory Commissions for terms to expire April 1st, 2020, uh, 2023. Um, and uh, first I'll ask if there are any comments from members of the public. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Move approval of the recommended actions. Second. Motion by Leopold, uh, second by McPherson. Your microphone's not on. Just want to say thank you to each of the commissioners. Uh, it's very much appreciated. What do we have? Over two two dozen commissions, and the amount of time and effort that uh, these commissioners put in is uh, much appreciated by this board and the people of Santa Cruz County. And yeah, and incredibly talented people uh, serve on these commissions. So, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. That passes unanimously. Uh, we now uh, have a 10:30 uh, scheduled item, which is a Zone Five Board of Directors. Uh, do we have Zone Five members here yet? We, we're a couple minutes. No, uh, okay. Why don't we Why don't we just uh, get started? Are you? You chair this one. I chair this one. All right. Um, so the Board of Supervisors shall recess in order to permit the Board of Directors of the County of Santa Cruz Flood Control and Water Conservation District, Zone 5, to convene and carry out uh, the regularly scheduled meeting. And let me just pull up the agenda. So uh, our first item is uh, for the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Chair. Director Leopold? Here. Sorry. Uh, I have that zone five year, the chair. Okay. Sorry. I'm, I'm happy to be the chair for zone five. I, I, you, Okay, well, sorry. <laughs> so we'll just, we'll just move forward. But go, you, I'll just you, witness the coup. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> let me start this the roll call over again. I apologize. For Zone 5 Directors, Director Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Bertrand. Christensen. And Chair Friend. I'm here. Are there any changes to today's agenda, Mr. Machado? Uh, none. All right. Um, are there any oral communications? It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items within the Zone 5 purview, uh, but not on today's agenda. Okay, seeing none. We'll move on to the minutes, which is approval of Zone 5 minutes. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Is there a motion for the minutes? Move approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty, a second from Supervisor Leopold. Any comments on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. And number three is the Board of Directors of the Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5 to consider the election of the chairperson and vice chairperson for 2019 as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. Mr. Machado, briefly. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the item before you is to elect a new chairperson and vice chairperson for 2019 uh, following the call for nominations by the 2018 Zone 5 Board Chair. That's you. <laughs> Thank so, you. Supervisor Coonerty, this was the timing issue, is that normally it's yes. the chair of the board. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I would nominate uh, uh, Director Coonerty to be chair, and uh, would it, who is the vice Caput. chair? Uh, Supervisor Caput to be uh, vice chair. Is that how we usually do it? Or we, okay. Okay. All right. Are there any other nominations? Are there any comments from the community on these nominations? Seeing none, we'll vote on the nominations. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes 
Unanimously, congratulations, Chair, if you could handle item four. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, thank you, uh, former chairperson friend. Uh, so uh, as a board of directors of the Santa, C Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5, uh, to accept and file the second quarter report for fiscal year 2018-19 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. Thank you, Chair and Directors. Uh, the item before you is our uh, second um, quarter of 1819 revenue. A uh, breakdown, just quickly, it includes 17,618 in drainage fees, 18,865 in permit processing fees, and $1,109 in interest and other, and other revenue. That is the total of our quarterly revenue summary. Uh, the item before you, the recommended action is to accept and file this report on the second quarterly report of 1819 Zone 5 expansion construction revenue, and I can answer any questions you may have. Does anybody have any questions? We seem to be on target for uh, funding. Here. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes, we are. And are there any members of public who wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, I bring it back to the... Uh, to the I uh, district for move to accept and file the report on the, on the revenue. I'll second. Motion by Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Machado. Um, we have a next scheduled item of Zone 7 Board Directors meeting at 1045. Uh, so not wanting to start an item and then having uh, to interrupt, why don't we recess until 1045? We'll hear the Zone 7 uh, item at 1045, and then we'll come back and hear uh, item number uh, 10 immediately following. My apologies to the people who are waiting. We're tr trying to figure out how to do this and not have it be interrupted, uh, and I think this is the best way. Thank you. <coughs> This time will be the Zone 7 meeting. Yeah. If we could begin with a roll call on Zone 7, please. There he is. Yes, thank you. Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Happit. Here. <laughs> McPherson. Here. Uh, Bannister. Here. Belichick. Here. And Chair Friend. Here. Are there any additions or changes or deletions to the agenda, Mr. Strudley? No, Chair Friend, there are not. All right, we're going to begin with oral communications. Anybody from the community would like to address us on things not on today's agenda for Zone 7, but within the purview of Zone 7? All right. I would actually like Mr. to Shredley? offer something for communications. Yes, thanks, mm -hmm. Chair Friend. Um, as the program manager for the Pajaro Storm Drain Maintenance District, I'd like to let uh, make the board aware of a project that district is pursuing in the lower portions of the watershed near the Pajaro Dunes community. As you know, the uh, proposed levy reconstruction project uh, with the core does not address any improvements downstream of Highway 1. 
and there are uh, ongoing flood concerns in the Pajaro Dunes community and uh, adjacent agricultural land associated with the slough system, the river, and the Pajaro Lagoon. Um, the district is embarking on a project uh, with Army Corps, different entirely from the authority for the levee reconstruction project. Uh, we would consider uh, that project very differently than the one that we're proposing here. Um, it's a, it's called a CAP project, it's a Continuing Authorities Program project, which uh, provides uh, cost share from the Army Corps uh, for feasibility and initial design. So it gets us into the design phase. Um, the funding for those projects are already authorized to uh, divisions and districts. So it does not go through the Herculean authorities and uh, obligation procedures that um, we're beholden to with the federal levy reconstruction project. Um, so we are pursuing that project and the local share for that um, project, we are uh, very actively pursuing grant funding from the state and hopeful that we will um, provide the local match funding from state uh, funds. So I am happy to provide more updates on this project as it becomes more formulated and concrete and just wanted to make you aware of that uh, activity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. We'll move on to the agenda now. Item four is the approval of the Zone 7 board meeting minutes for January 15th, 2019. Are there any questions on the minutes? Director Bill said, do you no have No questions, just going to move for approval. Okay, are there any comments from the community on the minutes? Uh, moving back, before we take action, just moving forward, I think we can include the minutes in the, under the consent agenda so they're not two separate items moving forward. Uh, so do we have a motion, Director Bilsich? So moved. Yes, so moved. Do we have a second, second. from, so we have a motion from Director Bilsich, a second from Director Caput, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We move on to our lengthy consent agenda of one item. Item five is as the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to adopt a resolution confirming the 2019-20 benefit assessment rates. That's what is listed under the consent agenda for those who didn't have it out there. Are there any questions or comments on this consent agenda item? I would move the consent agenda. Yep. And I'll second. We have a motion from Director Leopold and a second from Director Bilicic. Were there any comments on this item? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, it passes unanimously. Now we'll move on to the regular agenda, the program manager's report, which is that the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider a status update on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project. As outlined in the memo of the district engineer, we have the memo, the proposal, and the final letter there with the NACO resolution as well. Uh, please, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, members of the board. I'd like to provide you a, a comprehensive update on our federal levy reconstruction project with the Corps. Um, I'd like to begin by um, uh, uh, reminding the board that uh, in September, you authorized uh, staff to sign contract with uh, Cardno to perform CEQA analysis for the, for the project, and at the January board meeting, you authorized uh, staff to sign contract with Peterson Brewstad, uh, program management consulting team to lead us through the governance and finance aspects of the project as well as a review of core design uh, and other technical support for CEQA. Um, first, I'd like to speak to our progress with Cardno and the CEQA analysis. Um, we have spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time negotiating scope and uh, making sure that Cardno uh, can construct the right set of alternatives and the right CEQA analysis for us to support this project with the right project description. We've been doing that over the last several months and have finally um, secured a scope and budget with them which is attached to this board item for your review. Um, we are planning to embark on that contract uh, with CEQA beginning this next month in April. Um, and so that you are aware of the uh, planned progress on that front before we next have a chance to speak in June. Um, in April, uh, uh, Cardinal will be conducting backgrounding. Uh, their notice of preparation will be prepared during the month of May. Um, and scoping, and in June, they will be developing their alternatives analysis and beginning to prepare the draft administrative EIR. So by the time we speak uh, next, next time in June, hopefully we'll have uh, the beginnings of an administrative draft EIR in the works. Um, on the program management side, uh, the PBI consulting team has been working fast and furious for us. Um, 
we are putting all the pieces together with them to form the right governing body to support the finance structure for the project. Um, so in the interim, before our next meeting in June, there will be invitations sent out to rekindle the Governance and Finance Committee. Many of you, many of you on the board were part of that committee previously, and we will be uh, re-inviting those of you uh, to, again, have two discussions in late April and late May um, for that committee to quickly arrive at a consensus decision on the governing body aspects and the finance strategy to pursue. Um, with that said, I'm currently in the middle of reviewing some information from our PBI consulting <coughs> team with a lot of details, but I'm not prepared to report on that uh, today to you. Um, we are continuing to coordinate with the Army Corps despite their gap in funding. Um, we are urging staff at the Army Corps to continue at least quarterly meetings with us so that we can stay up to date with their thinking on how we can position the project for federal funding. Um, we issued a joint letter which is attached to this board item um, from Zone 7 and Monterey County Water Resources. Um, congratulating the Corps on finally finishing that feasibility report, but also stressing the importance of this project to us and highlighting the ongoing concerns we have and the values that this project is seeking to protect um, disadvantaged communities, high value ag land, um, and an urbanized center uh, in the town of Pajaro and the city of Watsonville. Um, we are hopeful that through the budgetary process, we will be awarded work plan funds next fall or next winter. Um, we are not uh, currently in the presidential budget with the core because we can't actually have the core request that funds without a signed report. And that signed report, again, we are still expecting uh, no earlier than March 29th, the signed director's report as well as the finalized feasibility uh, phase report. Um, I hear uh, some information from headquarters that they are being waylaid by a number of infrastructure initiatives and bills um, going through the ASA's office, which may delay the release of our report into the early parts of April, but that doesn't really affect the progress of the project at all, because really what we're going through right now is a lot of local activity for governance and finance activities and review of core modeling products through our PBI consultant. Um, Staff would like to thank Chair Friend as well as Supervisor John Phillips from Monterey County for bringing a resolution to the Environment, Energy, and Land Use Steering Committee of the National Association of Counties. Um, Chair Friend spent a, a good deal of time negotiating in terms of that resolution and also finding some partners across the country that, that share some interests and in projects that are similar to ours. And uh, it's really, uh, a great thing to have the voice of NACO behind us and behind our project. So thank you, Chair Friend. We are continuing to work with subvention staff at State Department of Water Resources. We finally gotten a hold of the core modeling products, their latest and greatest hydraulic model, which will now allow us to proceed with the application to subventions to um, auth not authorize the project, but secure the obligation of funds should federal investment come along. Um, and we are hopeful still that we're gonna get the maximum amount of cost share coming from the state uh, because of disadvantaged communities and because of protection of state facilities. Uh, and we would like to thank, thank uh, Assemblyman Mark Stone for continuing to support our work on the subventions <laughs> front. Um, with that, I would ask that the board uh, consider, accept, and file this status report on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project. I'm happy <coughs> to answer any questions. Thank Director you. Leopold. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I do want to acknowledge the work of my colleague, uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, those of us who've been to CSAC uh, uh, conferences know that not everybody in the state of California thinks like we do. But when you go to the NACO conference, you really understand that people around the, around the country don't always think this way that we do. Uh, so it takes a lot of work uh, to get uh, uh, unanimous support for this resolution. Uh, uh, I just want to appreciate the work. It's, you're, you did a great job representing the needs of Santa Cruz and Monterey County. And, and I, uh, uh, I just want to acknowledge that. I think that was, that was a real great addition to uh, have in, in our um, uh, utility belt for trying to get this work done on the river levee. Thank you. 
Director McPherson. I'd like to share those comments and thank uh, Supervisor Friend. Uh, and the quarterly meetings, those are regular, those haven't happened before as I, I mean, have they, that you mentioned? I think you were mentioning some quarterly meetings, but the, more to the point, I just wanted to do uh, the, I don't know who you contacted, but have other counties or states uh, shared the misery that we have through the last two or three decades like uh, we have, and we've got some colleagues throughout the nation that say, yeah, we want to be with you. Is that, who did you find? I'm just curious. Is it East Coast, West Coast, all around the nation, or what? Well, I'm Chair Friend came across uh, some uh, another resolution that was similar in tone to ours uh, from Navajo County of Arizona, and hmm. we have uh, through our advocacy work in D.C. and also um, our involvement with. National Association of Flood and Stormwater Management Agencies, we've come across others across the country who share the pain that we do, that have, simil have been in similar uh, instances of, of grief with the core or are continuing to have that grief with the core. Um, I think there's a growing groundswell of this type of concern. Um, the NACO resolution definitely supports that notion. Um, and we're definitely hopeful that this kind of support, this kind of voice behind the project will, in a grand scale, hopefully change the way the core and the OMB may do business, but uh, will hopefully bring Pajaro along for the ride Good. in that change. Yeah, well, thank you for that and getting the attention of NACO and some of our colleagues uh, in that organization. Director Bilsich, then Director Caput. I just wanted to say that my colleagues couldn't have said it any better without that leadership of Chairman Friend, this would not happen. And I think he's greatly appreciated by many of us here, but hopefully the entire county as to what, and, and people, the residents of Watsonville, this is a big deal. And um, I'm very proud of you, and I'm very happy that you stepped forward and did this. So thank you very much. Thanks for those kind words. Uh, Director Caput. You bet. Uh, I wanna thank you also. Thank you also, Mark. Uh, when we're talking about the project and we're talking about, there's different uh, levels of uh, flood prevent, uh, reduction. What exactly, uh, in a shorter explanation, are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, our support for a 25, 50, 100 year plan? I know that that's you know, bigger than what we're looking at right here. So right now, the proposed uh, NED project from the core includes mostly uh, protection against the so-called 100-year uh, flood event. Um, the exception to that would be in the urbanized areas on the, the north side of Salsipoitis Creek between Highway 152 and the agricultural land, so protecting the residential communities adjacent to the river. Um, the economic uh, justification proposed by the core um, relegated that level of protection and improvement to 25 year. It's not something we're totally happy about, but it's a lot better than that's what they're, what's there now. Uh, there are no levees there actually now, so the protection that's sure. afforded is by virtue of the facility on the southern bank. Um, we are still very much looking at improving upon what the core is proposing. And it may not be a solution that is afforded to us through the federal government. It's most likely not going to be. It may be opportunities elsewhere through the state. Um, we're definitely wanting for a, a more improved uh, project than what's being proposed. And um, there's a lot of nuts and bolts to how this may all fall out, but we're continuing to look at other opportunities. And there are a lot of new uh, grant uh, bond funded opportunities at the state that may open some doors to us. And our PBI consultant team is actually very in tune with that as our staff here at the Flood Control District. And we're continuing to pursue those very actively when they sure. become available. And uh, we'll, we'll be hearing about that fairly shortly or? So we will hear whether the Army Corps headquarters is comfortable with the proposed project that the district and division are putting forth, and we'll see that when they sign the director's report and the final GRR, the feasibility report. We'll see that within the next month. In terms of funding, that's something we're gonna see next fall or next winter when we are requesting work plan funds from the Corps to support initial design. 
Okay, right now we're, uh, but we're focused on the northern part uh, from Highway 1, or are we also focused on the southern part, I'm assuming, which would be Murphy Road all the way to Highway 1? The federal proposed project begins downstream at Highway 1 and moves upstream, and depending on which side of the river you're on, it does go um, not quite up to Murphy's Crossing. So on the southern side, they're proposing a tieback levee um, upstream of the town of Pajaro. On the north side of the river, there are no improvements uh, planned. On, on which part? Upstream of the confluence with Salsipoides Creek on the main stem of the Pajaro River. Okay. So those are the gaps in the federal project that we're continuing to look for opportunities to fill. Yes. Is it an all or, all or nothing proposition or are there, we've got things we can work out with, uh, again, when we come to that 25, 50, and 100 year? Um, yes and no. It's an all or nothing. So there were arrangements that were made prior to my beginnings here with the district where, um, and, and Chair Friend was, was a principal player in those negotiations to basically accept the proposed plan from the core um, and without that, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere with the core. So it, it took that leadership um, to recognize that in order to get federal investment, we need to perhaps peel back a pieces of the project and seek those components through other means. That being said, as we move through the initial uh, investment strategy with the federal government, um, there's lots of different ways you can approach a project. There's lots of different ways other flood control districts throughout the state have successfully built projects that had challenges uh, similar to ours. And that some of them included pursuing the project that's described in different pieces. Others uh, describe a process where you reformulate the project and describe other benefits that may come out of it. So we're looking to achieve the most expeditious result. Um, but it, the details of that investment uh, through the core and OMB will kind of play into those, those decisions as we move forward. I, I guess uh, my last comment would be I, I'm impressed by one thing, and that's the communications going on with the Army Corps and Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. And, uh, but at the same time, um, are they, you know, we're going to find out if they're just being nice or they're going to give us, you know, uh, the same results as in the past. What's good is in the past there was hardly any communication. It was very hard to talk to them. Now they are talking, which is great. There's, there's no being nice at this point. They're either going <laughs> to fund our project or they're not, and it's going to be a decision that comes not from the district office or the division. It's going to come from headquarters and OMB. So they're either going to fund our project or they're not. Um, yeah, I, I guess the point I was trying to make is how important is this communications uh, towards a favorable uh, result? I, 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 I really think it's good that we are talking, but at the same time, I'm hoping that we get a different result than we got in the past. The, the deputy director of the district office has uh, is a new individual as of um, late last calendar year. That individual is much more helpful and supportive than the prior deputy director. And that individual has made um, his own efforts at reaching out to us to update us on status, to let us know the tenor of conversation when he makes his trips back to headquarters to the extent that he knows about them. Um, so he has been very helpful. Um, he is helping us deliver some of our messaging to the core um, and getting, it, getting us a bit of insider baseball to play with, more so than we did before. So that's always helpful. Um, but we still have some challenges, especially with OMB. You bet. And we have had uh, support from Senator Feinstein and uh, Camila Harris and uh, Jimmy Panetta, of course, with the Congress, which... Yes. Kind of nice. Uh, you've met with uh, Army Corps with them, and or they've met separately. We've we've met separately, but I believe that some of the staff have have had discussions sure. with Army Corps, especially uh, Jimmy Panetta's staff okay. and Jimmy Panetta himself. Thank you. Thank you. 
Is anybody in the community that would like to address us on this item? I'll bring, I'll bring back, we still haven't, yeah. No problem, Mary. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner of Aptos. Thank you for that great report. And I also want to thank you, Mr. Strudley, for the great presentation you made um, Saturday at the State of the San Lorenzo River Symposium. It was fascinating. And what I took a home from that was that the winter of 2016-17 could be the new normal. <laughs> That's a little worrisome. <laughs> so, but very uh, germane to what we're talking about here right now. And, um, as a member of the community, I don't understand uh, many of the acronyms that you've used here in your discussion about the, the NACO resolution. I, don't, I have no idea what that stands for and why it is so significant, but I appreciate the efforts of Supervisor Friend to do the negotiations um, regarding that. I, again, um, uh, want to suggest that especially perhaps in the area uh, of the South Sapuetes area where it's the levee to be built would only handle a 25 year storm which it seems a little worrisome that perhaps with it being near agricultural areas that this county could partner with uh, Dr. Andy Fisher of the Recharge Initiative and um, consult with Dr. Helen Dahlke of UC Davis. And I've spoken with you about this before, but there is significant groundwater recharge opportunity that could be built into a levee. And it could, um, in my way of thinking, enhance funding, especially since the um, Pajaro Basin is in critical overdraft. And Ms. Bannister, you would know more about this than anybody. <laughs> that there could be some component of groundwater recharge built into a levee where a floodgate could be opened and controlled amounts of water be let into well documented recharge potential areas of agricultural land that are not being farmed in the winter. And there could be some recharge. It seems like that could enhance um, funding, <coughs> at least with a state level. And um, finally, I would like to ask where I might find the hydraulic models that you talk about um, being done for the uh, Pajaro flood control area. I'd, I'd like to see those models. Thank you very much. NACO is the National Association of Counties. Oh. Director Bannister. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, I too would like to thank staff, Mark Strudley, Supervisor Friend for the continued scratching and clawing to move this project forward. I, I think the progress in the last year has been tremendous compared to what I'd seen before, and that's without the Corps being as involved as we like. I just want to share that last fall I attended a meeting that Harry Wiggins held in Pajaro, a severely disadvantaged community, similar to the Watsonville side where it's significantly disadvantaged. And um, at that meeting, they had the head of the Office of Emergency Services come, and it, it's the Pajaro Community Action Committee, I think. <clears throat> and they were talking about how to do evacuations in the event of another flood. And someone said, where's the list of people who are mobility impaired who would need someone to come in and get them out? And the head of the OES said there is no list because of privacy concerns. And someone said, well, how would we know? And the neighbors are relied on then to tell the emergency responders where the handicapped people or people with mo mobility issues are. In 96, the flood of 96, someone, one of the two people that died was in a wheelchair. So there is a real human component to this. So thank you to all of you. Director Machado and everyone who's really working on this because there is this human component that we forget and um, the fact that there are people sitting around trying to figure out how to identify these people in the event of another flood while you know this work isn't getting done or is getting done. Thank you for the progress you're making. Thank you. Is there a motion for this item? <laughs> so moved. Second. We have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from <laughs> Director Leopold. Director Cavett, were you seconding the item? A third. A third. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Passes unanimously. Thank you, Director Stradley. Thank you for your work on that. And now we'll, I'll hand it back to the chair. That's the end of the Zone 7 agenda. Great.
Uh, so now we're moving on to item number nine. Uh, it's a public hearing to, cons or sorry, item number 10, uh, which is a public hearing to consider a resolution amending the general plan and the local coastal program and an ordinance amending the Santa Cruz County uh, Code Chapter 13.10 uh, to create a permanent housing combining zone district with CEQA notice of exemption as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. And I wanna um, apologize and thank everyone who's patiently waited to speak on this item today and uh, turn it over to planning. Okay, just a moment, uh, technical difficulties. Okay. Uh, thank you, board. Good, uh, good morning. I just want to take a moment to introduce one of the newer members of our staff in the planning department. This is Daisy Allen. She will be presenting the item, and we're very pleased to have her with us and to introduce her to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Paya. Um, all right, so thank you, Chair Coonerty and Supervisors. The purpose of today's public hearing is to consider general plan and county code amendments uh, to create a permanent room housing combining zone district, as recommended by the Planning Commission. I'll be providing a brief review of the combining district's purpose and vision, as well as the proposed components of the policy. Oh, how do I get back? To we usually do oh, this too. Uh, Just scroll down, yeah. okay. This is part of the hazing routine for yeah. new staff members. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. All right, so the permanent room housing or PRH policy initiative is rooted in the general plan's housing element, which recognizes that former hotel and motel properties can serve an important role in addressing the housing crisis by converting rooms and cabins to housing units that are affordable by design due to their small unit size. In fact, there are properties throughout the county where visitor accommodation facilities have already been converted uh, to long-term rental housing, meaning housing uh, rented for 30 days or more. Um, however, multifamily rental housing uh, is not an allowed use on many of these properties due to the existing zoning or general plan designations. Uh, similarly, there are properties in the county with vacant buildings that were originally constructed as care facilities, such as assisted living and nursing homes, um, and could be repurposed to housing units as well. Um, but they face the same zoning and general plan uh, barriers. Um, as you can see on the slide, these are photographs of three properties um, that uh, are actually considered opportunity sites for permanent room housing. There are additional photographs throughout the presentation. Um, as you can see, there are a mix of existing conditions from small cabins in the woods to former roadside motels, et cetera. Okay, so uh, in June of last year, the board directed staff to implement housing element program 4.5 by developing the permanent room housing combining zone district. The intent of the district is to preserve these existing rental units. Uh, by creating a regulatory pathway for permanent housing on these properties, the county can offer the potential to recognize this housing option as a legal and conforming use, therefore providing more secure legal basis for permanent multifamily housing uh, to continue on these properties over time. Uh, the district would not be resolving outstanding code enforcement cases that are unrelated to the zone district, uh, and also would not be legalizing unpermitted structures. However, illegal structures could be recognized through a building permit process or participation in the county's safe structures program. Um, so uh, this graphic illustrates how the combining zone district would work. Um, so every zone district here in the county has two basic components associated with it, site development standards, as well as allowed land uses. A uh, combining zone district is a set of property use and development standards that functions as an overlay on top of the underlying zoning. So in the case of PRH, the site standards associated with the underlying zone district would continue to apply. Uh, the combining zone district would then add an additional allowed use, permanent room housing, uh, with specific associated standards. Uh, the uses uh, allowed in the underlying zone district would still be allowed. One exception to this rule is that the proposed district would limit short-term rentals as an allowed use on properties in the district. Um, so this slide provides a brief history of the permanent room housing policy project so far. Staff determined that the most effective way to draft the policy would be to work directly with the owners of properties that would potentially be appropriate for the district. Uh, staff identified opportunity sites and worked collaboratively uh, with property owners in order to draft the code such that the development standards uh, reflect the wide variety of existing conditions on these sites, 
uh, and make the district available to as many uh, properties as possible. Uh, out of that process, five property owners representing nine properties and 73 potential uh, PRH units uh, did agree to join in the collaborative uh, code development process and they submitted uh, rezoning applications to us. Uh, on January 23rd, the Planning Commission held a public hearing to review the general plan and code amendments uh, for the proposed district, and they also concurrently considered applications from the nine properties to join the district. Uh, the Commission decided to wait uh, to consider the property applications until after the policy is finalized. Um, the Commission was generally supportive of the PRH district, um, but did direct staff to make changes uh, to the draft code regarding minimum parking requirements, uh, short-term rentals, and uh, the application processing level. Um, at a continued hearing on February 13th, the Commission recommended board approval of the PRH Combining Zone District, and a link to that report is provided uh, in its attachment F in your packet. Um, so there are two components to the policy initiative. Uh, first, uh, new policies are needed in the land use section of our general plan to enable the creation of the district. The draft general plan amendments are provided uh, as Exhibit A to attachment C in your packet. Uh, secondly, county code would be amended uh, to create the new uh, district. A clean version of the draft ordinance is provided as attachment A and a strikeout version as attachment B. Um, in terms of the general plan amendments, uh, changes are needed to policies for both residential and commercial land use. Um, some of the PRH opportunity sites have a residential general plan designation, but conversion to housing nev nevertheless does not conform with the general plan because the density of house housing units is higher than would otherwise be allowed. Uh, the proposed policy changes would allow existing densities on PRH sites to remain. Uh, and other PRH opportunity sites have commercial land use designations. Currently, the general plan allows up to 50% residential square footage on commercial properties. The proposed policy would allow up to 100% residential square footage on the PRH sites. Okay, and then uh, in terms of the code changes, um, the code defines a PRH unit as an independent space for long-term rental occupancy uh, that meets uh, specific development standards. This definition allows flexibility for shared kitchens and bathrooms and recognizes that some PRH opportunity sites are buildings with, sink, with rooms that open onto a hall or outdoor walkway, while other opportunity sites are former uh, vacation cabin properties. Um, the PRH combining zone district would be allowed in all residential, commercial, and special use zone districts on parcels with buildings that were originally permitted uh, for visitor accommodations or care facilities. Um, once an application is made uh, to uh, add PRH zoning to a property, staff would inspect existing structures using the county's um, PRH health and safety inspection checklist. This checklist is provided as attachment H in your packet. Uh, building upgrades for health and safety would need to meet current building code uh, or they would go through the safe structures program. Uh, the proposed uh, development standards in the code uh, reflect an accommodation of a range of existing conditions on the PRH opportunity sites, um, balanced with the need to maintain consistency with the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, staff also researched standards used in similar ordinances in other jurisdictions, and there's a table uh, comparing uh, those jurisdictions as attachment G in the packet. Um, PRH properties would be able to maintain the existing number of units on the property and could increase the number of units in certain cases. Unit size uh, would range from 120 to 500 square feet, um, with larger existing units allowed to be grandfathered in. Uh, new PRH units, aside from one optional manager's unit per property, would be limited to 500 square feet to ensure that the units are um, uh, affordable by design. Uh, kitchen and bath facilities could be individual or shared, as I mentioned, and full kitchens are not required. Uh, minimum parking requirements are one space per unit, um, with lower minimums in certain cases. Um, bike parking and storage are encouraged uh, because these can be very useful for units like this, um, but not required due to the range of existing conditions on the PRH opportunity sites. Uh, so in terms of affordability, um, since the units are considered to be affordable by design, uh, there is not a requirement for deed restricted affordable housing on these sites. Uh, however, property owners would be welcome to participate in affordable housing programs. Supportive services would be could be offered on site, but would not be required. Uh, in terms of short-term rentals, uh, short-term rentals would not be allowed on the residentially zoned parcels in the combining zone district. Um, and on the commercially zoned properties, short-term rentals or um, the visitor accommodation use uh, would be allowed on up to 30% of the units. Um, and those 
uh, those units or rooms would not be considered PRH units. This means, uh, what this uh, code means is that um, seasonal rentals would not be allowed in the district. Um, it also means that property owners um, with parcels that may be eligible for PRH in some cases would need to choose uh, between short and long-term uses in order to join the district. Um, in the case of commercially zoned properties, owners can potentially apply for exceptions to increase the percentage of short-term rental units on their property. Um, and speaking of exceptions, exceptions to PRH standards could be granted on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, provided that the appropriate findings could be made. Uh, the exception option is an important part of the code because each property that applies for inclusion in this district is unique, uh, and these sites are already built out, so flexibility is needed uh, in the regulations. Uh, to consider these unique situations. For instance, in the applications we have so far, uh, two properties have requested exceptions to the parking requirement, um, and two other properties have requested exceptions to the 30% short-term rental uh, requirement. Okay, and then the application process. Um, property owners with eligible uh, parcels would apply for zoning plan amendments, as well as use and development permits to join the district. Uh, property owners could apply for the use and development permit concurrently with a zoning plan amendment as a level seven review, uh, or they could apply for the zoning plan amendment first and then come back for a use and development permit as a level six review. Uh, where required, coastal development permits would also be needed as well as building permits um, uh, as needed based on the results of the building health and safety inspections. Um, so next steps. Um, uh, First, regarding CEQA, um, establishment of the PRH combining zone district is exempt from CEQA review uh, because the nine properties that have submitted applications uh, and are therefore reasonably re uh, foreseeable as joining the district um, uh, are already uh, in use, uh, have been in use as permanent housing and there would be no change in that use and therefore no new environmental impacts um, from their addition to the district. A notice of exemption has been prepared um, for your consideration and recommendation as attachment D. Um, so moving forward, if the board uh, approves the proposed uh, amendments along with the CEQA notice of exemption, staff would then post the exemption and would uh, move on to uh, get this scheduled at upcoming uh, Coastal Commission public hearing. Uh, after certification by the Coastal Commission, staff would then begin to take property specific rezoning and use permit applications through the public hearing process. Um, so staff recommends that the board hold a public hearing and affirm the proposed amendments are exempt from CEQA and then approve the amendments in concept and direct staff to place the proposed amendments on your next meeting agenda for second reading and final adoption. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff about this item? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank <coughs> you for the presentation. Uh, thank you for the work on this. There's a couple questions I have. Um, one was uh, the question about storage. You know, it was interesting. I really appreciated getting them the uh, chart of the different um, communities. Uh, and uh, the storage issue seems to be real uh, for people who are going to be living there for longer than 30 days, having a place to put their clothes. Another um, needs seems to be important. Uh, do you have any idea of how many of these nine properties have or don't have closets or storage space? Hmm. Um, yeah, the, mo most of the units do have closets, but don't have an extra, like external storage unit like or a dresser. Um, or, or, or like a like a storage a storage space that's oh, separate okay. from the living space. Got right. It. Right, uh, yeah, most of the units um, do have some kind of closet or storage space within their unit. Right. Um, but uh, those, the size of those spaces does vary. Um, so in terms of setting a code standard for that, we stop short of doing that in the, in the draft. Um, the other question I had was about uh, short-term rentals. Um, and you uh, point out that uh, it would only be for those that are on commercially zoned property, which I imagine is most of these. Um, and but you said seasonal rentals wouldn't be allowed. And uh, could you just point me to the code where that's where, where that is clear? Sure. Um, just a moment. Okay. So um, if you go to uh, packet page seventy-one at the top on K, short-term rentals, 
Um, so uh, under K1, um, short-term, less than 30-day rentals are not allowed on designated PRH units. So um, what that means is you couldn't have um, a, a unit that was rented um, as a PRH unit for maybe nine months out of the year and then for three months out of the year rented as a short-term rental. So the 30% the would be saying uh, of, my, of my 10 units, I'm gonna put three and make those vacation rentals? That's correct. And they would have to get a vacation rental permit for each of them, or how does that work? Yeah, so it's actually for commercial properties. So vacation rentals only apply for um, residentially zoned properties. So on commercially zoned properties, this would be the visitor accommodation, kind of traditional hotel room use, um, and they would have to get a use, a use permit for that. Or in some cases, um, on some properties, uh, it, they may have an existing use permit for the hotel use. Yeah, it, um, it, it seems to me that we would wanna make sure that there's a TO, active TOT certificate, that they're, that they're part of the actual program, or it just seems like this, this could be wildly abused. Yeah, so in terms of the short-term rental portion uh, of the units on, uh, on the commercially zoned properties, that would be, um, that would have to be a separate, or I, we envision that as a separate use permit with conditions for the hotel, the hotel use. So just, to, uh, just so I understand, so we have a former motel, right, that's now being used as longer term housing. Uh, owner decides uh, of my 10 units, I wanna keep three of them for hotel rooms or motel mm -hmm. rooms. Right. When I come in for the PRH zoning, Am I also concurrently coming in for any zoning on those three, or because that's probably already zoned that way, that it's that you're really only getting a PRH for those seven other units? Right. So, I think it would de it would depend on the, the site specific conditions. But for instance, we have one application in right now that um, already has a mix of short and long term. Um, uh, rentals on the property and would want to continue that, and they're already zoned and have a use permit for the um, the short term, the hotel use. Okay. So they would come in for, so that their ap the application is for, or we actually have two applications like that, so the, the application is for just the PRH units. Got it. And the, um, uh, well, yeah, I just want to make sure that we don't end up turning this into, uh, you know, people, if we're, we want this to be used for housing, I want it to stay uh, as housing. Mm -hmm. um, the other question I had is, these are, the, the, the proposed nine here are um, in, in just two districts, but do we, are, do we expect others from other parts of the county? I mean, I know that there are some places in the first district, I think they're in the coastal zone, so that's why we haven't, we aren't seeing them. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, at the beginning of this process, I did do some research on, you know, the locations of, you know, all the kind of hotels in the, in the county and, um, and, and uh, came up with a list of properties that were formerly hotels but are now used as housing. Um, it was mostly in the fifth district and the second district. There were some properties in the first district as well, um, just from that, that research right. project. Um, uh, but we did, and we did have an in informational meeting in September, and we reached out to a larger number of property owners, and not everyone wanted to participate. So some at this of the time. ones that, that are currently that 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 are former motels but have a unclear status, let's just say, they they're not you're not holding them back because they're in the coastal zone, but they haven't really come forward. Yeah, and we we did meet with coastal staff and. Um, uh, the way the, the ordinance is, is written is that if you are um, if you are zoned uh, visitor accommodation or if you have a general plan designation of CV, um, you wouldn't be able to uh, participate in this in this program. And the reason for that is um, it would be in violation of our general plan policy of priority coastal uses. So the Sunny Cove Motel there on Johans would. would uh, would not, the, the Coastal Commission would not allow us to turn that into a house. Right, I'm not sure what the zoning is on that site, but if it's VA, then pro it is. probably I don't, not. I, don't, yeah. I haven't looked at it recently. Okay. Yeah, but if, if a property was, say, zoned residential and used to be a motel a long time ago and converted to residential, then perhaps that property would be able to join the district. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your work.
Other questions? Yeah, I, just, I shared the concern about the storage aspect of it too, uh, but thank you for addressing that. Uh, and I, I support this as another tool in our toolkit to try to address the housing crisis in Santa Cruz County. I mean, we've, we've um, reacted to the uh, accessory dwelling units and um, which are about, what, 640 square feet. This is 150 to 500 square feet, is that correct? 120 uh, to 500. 120. Okay, um, and you know, in the short-term ter rentals too, uh, uh, there's a little concern there. It says, as currently proposed, um, um, is there any reason we have that phrase in there? We are just instead of saying the ordinance would not allow, period? Um, no. <laughs> um, I just uh, want to make, I th I'd like to make it a little more definitive, I think. Um, yeah. Well, I mean. In the I, ordinance, we use that phrase or in the staff report? I'm, I'm looking at the staff report here. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I, partly the reason that's there is, is we wanted to let you know that this was also a discussion at the Planning Commission. Okay. And we made some revisions based on what the Planning Commission had to say. So the current version. Okay, got it. Okay, because I'd, I'd like to make that more definitive, in, uh, and which you will, I'm sure. Um, but I, I, uh, the, a lot of, some of these will be up in my district, in the 5th District, in the San Jose Valley, I think, and or are, and uh, you know, we have some limitations there because of the overtaxed septic system and uh, the traffic concerns as well. But uh, I think uh, the important part of it is disallowing the vacation rentals too, as was mentioned. Uh, those were the major concerns I had. But uh, I just hope we don't see a lot of storage and boxes and whatever outside on the walls of uh, these uh, these units, but uh, I think it's another good step that the county is taking to try to provide uh, some housing uh, for for those who uh, in this permanent room uh, uh, room housing proposal. I think it's uh, another good step for us to uh, address our housing crisis in Santa Cruz County. So thank you. Uh, very briefly, before we were in public, I mean, overall, I think this is a good policy. I support the changes around the vacation rental. One question you had at the slide up that any additions or remodels would comply with the building code. Uh, would that also apply with the, like the county ordinances around affordable uh, housing set-asides? Uh, if they added seven units or, or four units, would, would one of them have to be affordable, that sort of thing? It, I am not sure. I'm, I'm assuming yes, but there might be something about not applying those fees to um, commercial, sh you know, vacation, rental, hotel kinds of places. But for the permanent room housing units, I would assume, w you know what, we actually, I remember now, I'm so sorry. Um, we haven't fully landed on, on that part of it because there's a question about which fees would be charged, et cetera, and we were going to work those out in the time between this and when you actually see applications. So when you see applications, that will be covered. Okay, so, so, it would, so it's going to be covered, it's just a question of under what? It looks like the planning director approach. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, these are rental units, right. and so at most they would be the affordable housing impact fee. Okay. And under, as currently structured, if you're doing additions, you only trigger the fee if you're fi addition of 500 square feet or more. Mm -hmm. So we're not anticipating that this is going to be a big fee revenue okay. generator for the affordable one. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's open it up to the public. Uh, if you'd like to comment, please line up. My name is Francis Padilla. I represent six sites going through the current process. Uh, there are no rental units in these six sites and probably won't do any additions either. And we're in favor of the PRH ordinance amendment and uh, look forward to do it, the, uh, finishing up with you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Maggie Ivey with Visit Santa Cruz County. Uh, I read the staff report yesterday and I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, I think it's a great project and maybe there's an opportunity to expand it. I'm not sure what the plans are for additional outreach. When I reviewed the nine um, prior visitor serving properties, the only one that I recognized was Bayview Hotel in Aptos Village. So I'm assuming that every all the other ones have been non visitors serving for the most part for a very long time. They've never been part of our tourism marketing district um, for the visitor serving properties around the county. So I, 
I guess um, I just wanted to encourage additional outreach. You know, there's been about a 20% increase by the time all the projects are built, new lodging properties in our community. That and increased vacation rental stock. Um, we have a lot more inventory online and coming online. So it may be an opportunity for some of the aging and obsolete properties around the county. Perhaps the city of Santa Cruz might want to look at this model as well. Um, I think it's a great way to create some more um, inventory for housing. And then just one caution. Uh, I was concerned about the Bayview Hotel. We have this beautiful Aptos Village redevelopment project, and that's the only visitor serving lodging opportunity right there in this very walkable um, area. Uh, and it's, in its current state, it's obviously pretty compromised, and I don't know that that's a compatible situation for that particular area of the county. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Mrs. Santa Cruz County, too, for, uh, we've engaged them in some discussions with them and trying to work with to see how we can uh, accommodate them and work together in providing some adequate housing for more people. So thank you. I know the, the discussions are ongoing, but I just want to thank you for doing that. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. Um, first of all, I want to say that I have attended almost all of the meetings that the planning department has held with these property owners um, because I, I do assist Ms. Locke, the owner of the Bayview Hotel, and I really want to thank um, Ms. Allen for her wonderful, <laughs> her wonderful um, manner with the, the public. She's been extremely responsive and very, very approachable. And I really am grateful for all of her good work and outreach with the public and her report today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, I also have questions about the, the outreach to other um, facilities, um, and that was brought up at different points during this process. Um, this. This could also be extended to convalescent centers that are in um, disrepair. And I look at a couple in Live Oak, actually the, the heart and hand is huge. And I know someone who's there. So if you drive around to the back, there is a good percent of that facility that is not in use. And um, I think that's definitely one to look at, as is the, the uh, manor that is now closed on 38th Avenue. I used to know someone that lived there too, and it's now shuttered. So I think this is a great opportunity. And what I s have seen in sitting in on these meetings, it's, it's really the intent has been to um, recognize and legalize what has been going on for a long time and to really um, acknowledge the, the, the piece that it helps out in our community with, with housing. What, what happened with this short-term stay was that there are commercial properties like the Bayview Hotel that could, um, it could be more lucrative for them during the busy tourist season not to have someone there long-term, but during the slow term, it would be a great help to them to keep them going economically. And so I'm glad that the Planning Commission has allowed a 30% use for that. And to that end, it could, specifically to the Bayview Hotel, assist with uh, students at Cabrillo College, perhaps partnering with Cabrillo College as an apprenticeship for their culinary arts and hotel restaurant management programs. And those students could also work at the Aptos Village Project where housing prices are way out of reach of most of students. So um, I just want to uh, congratulate Ms. Allen for getting this to this point. And um, I want to say also that there has been some very negative publicity regarding the Bayview Hotel. And I was disappointed to see um, certain people in the community weighing in saying that it was going to be affordable housing and a rural detriment. And that is not at all the case. The Bayview Bayview Hotel is empty right now because of damage done you, by. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you so much. Hi. Good morning, honorable uh, supervisors and members of the public. My name is Michael Cox. I'm an employee of uh, Doreen and Dion Listener. They're the owners of the former uh, Arabian Motel in Rob Roy Junction. 
uh, at Highway 1 and uh, Freedom Boulevard. Uh, the motel was the first structure built in uh, Rob Roy Junction in 1949 and has long been used as permanent room housing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, voice my support for this program. Uh, I think staff and the department heads, uh, your commission, uh, have worked very hard on this. I, I think Ms. Allen has brought forward a really well thought proposal. She's worked hard on the exceptions and loopholes. It's always difficult to uh, come up, as you know, with one size fits all regulations. A lot of these properties are very different. Um, I would like to encourage your support of this uh, PRH uh, zoning amendment if you can and I think given the commission uh, did modify it to require individual review at a high level, um, each of these properties will have to be um, vetted individually and I think that'll be a, an excellent uh, safeguard for any concerns about things that might have been overlooked. We would really welcome the uh, gaining the proper zoning and use uh, authorities and then we could work on concerns such as storage. You know, we do have some storage. The owners have no plans to change this building. It's very affordable. Uh, the residents have all met and voiced their support for this as well. And we would love to work forward on maybe being able to put in a little storage shed or something in the future so that some of them that do tend to accumulate a lot of stuff don't have to have boxes out on their deck. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good morning, supervisors. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and to have the public uh, input that is so important on something like this. Um, I think that the creativity of this particular ordinance that is coming before you, the permanent room housing, is a grand idea. And to have uh, you look at that in, in this way is wonderful. And, and of course, Daisy has been absolutely incredible in the outreach. And of course, we, we really like Julie Conway. So the face of this ordinance are your staff members who are really e exemplary. And I wanted to say that. One thing I wanted to mention as somebody who's been around since the general plan in 1994 when I sat through weeks of testimony and et cetera, and there have been changes along the way, one of the things that is confusing to me is the, the letter M as the mountain district because sometimes I believe it to be confusing with multi-residential. And oftentimes I, I just wonder about that. Uh, not anything to do really with this other than the um, residential mountain thing that's addressed here. Uh, one of my clients does have a couple of properties involved in this and has been long-term known to the community um, and has, uh, I, think, I think there are definitely community members who've done a really good job with this. And they, in fact, are affordable by design even though they were under an affordability component uh, in an agreement that was made actually the rents that they were always charging were less even than those provided by housing and community development hcd who puts these the numbers out so i just wanted to say that it is possible when things are by design to be affordable in in their just their the way they are what they are and how they are so thank you very much for considering that i really appreciate it thank you thank you that concludes public comment, and I'll bring it back to the board, Supervisor Leopold. Yeah, so just a quick, quick question. The, the, uh, Ms. McNair uh, just brought up the question about affordable by design. Do, do you have, uh, did you do any kind of census to find out what these rooms are renting for now? Um, yes, we did uh, think about asking or requiring that as uh, part of the application process yeah. for the rezoning. We ended up not requiring that, um, but some of the applicants did um, give us uh, that information. Um, so what I saw was a range from about $700 to about $1,200, um, but there, and yeah, kind of everything in between, and um, there's probably some that are a little higher. There, some of the um, units are, are larger than others, so. 
Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting for us to have a baseline of information until we were able to, to check over time whether these really stay affordable by design or, or not. Um, I, I just think that's helpful to know that our policy actually um, accomplishes our goal. Mm -hmm. um, so if there's a way to request that information so we have it and then we can get a report back at, at some time uh, to just see where we are with that, I think it would be very helpful. Supervisor or friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I appreciate the work of, of Ms. Allen, Ms. Levine, and others that have worked on this. Uh, I support the PRH in concept, but not actually how this ordinance is currently drafted. The, in order for me to support it, there are some changes uh, that I would like to see. I have some concerns with uh, what it could possibly allow and not necessarily provide the board or staff with periodic uh, review. I'm still not sold that there's any compelling interest to allow short-term rentals or not. To me, it's either housing or it's not. I think it's strange to uh, have a 30 percent. I know that there was a higher percentage initially recommended by staff, but I think that uh, the fact that people are already interested in exemptions is a clue that uh, what the board's actual intent is might not actually occur, which is that either you want something to be a hotel and used providing that service to the community and the greater community, or you want it to be housing. So I would be uh, actually supportive of eliminating that. Specifically, also, I'd be supportive of making this uh, have a specific review period or a conditional use permit. In San Jose, it's a five-year review. Uh, right now, as we know, it's very difficult to bring up uh, problematic properties for any kind of review. I think that if we had an established review period similar to what we do for cannabis, I think that that would be Im important. And specific to that, since findings would need to be made for denial, I think that the board, under the current construct, there's a broad health, wealth, health safety and welfare uh, catch-all, but I think that we should actually enumerate what those things are on cannabis under 7.130110, while not directly akin to what we're doing here today, obviously. Uh, it does enumerate ways that things can be denied. I would have concerns with properties that have, for example, multiple criminal, civil, environmental violations, properties that haven't paid taxes, properties that haven't paid transit occupancy taxes. Uh, if you've been a recidivist and a bad actor historically, I don't see why it was, would be that the county would uh, formalize this process and reward you, and I'd like to see those elements brought back to the board so that we could actually uh, have that. I would also like, I have some concerns regarding, uh, in the staff report, it talks about the fact that once this were formalized, there would be a hope or an expectation that some of these properties would be brought up beyond the substandard conditions that people are currently living in. I'd like to take a step back also to remind people that these are properties that are violating our current ordinance. And we have people that are living in these units illegally, they're living in substandard units, and a lot of them, not all. Uh, and these things aren't being enforced. And so when you look at the HUD checklist, it's pretty top line. I mean, it says things like, you shouldn't have a severe infestation of vermin. It doesn't say anything about the conditions that lead to that. It just says that that's apparently a qualification that the, the county then would be signing off saying is an acceptable housing condition for people to live in. I, I just don't, I'm not there yet on, on how lax I think that that HUD checklist is. It also doesn't say specifically which of those things within the checklist would be a denial. It just says it's a yes, no, and there's no understanding of this board as to what it would mean that we'd be allowing people to live in. So if they were improved, which is a good thing, then I think to Supervisor Leopold's point on the cost, uh, I would assume that rents could increase and then we could have a displacement situation. And I would like to see uh, something formalized that says that we either have the live work requirement that we have for other affordable housing investments that we do here, where we're saying these shall be local residents, these shall be people that live and work here, and these shall not be things that are turned into, in essence, second homes for people over the hill. You could envision a situation by which somebody could look at this unit, especially if they're brought up to be nice, and it becomes now $1,500 a month or $1,800 a month, where that's cheaper than either a second home or a vacation rental, and now you've lost the housing component, but they're treating it as an actual residential unit, which is something that wouldn't be within the board's intention. So these are some of the concerns that I have that I think need to be addressed before. Uh, I can definitely vote on in favor of it, but I also think that this is the intention of the board anyway. If we're trying to provi provide affordable housing, and you don't want displacement. If you're tr trying to provide housing that's, that's above substandard, then we should enumerate what that is. If you have people that have been historic bad actors, then we should make sure that they're not allowed into the program. And under the current construct, what's before us, none of those things exist. So if my colleagues are amenable to it, I'd like to see this item come back, but with this information provided and options for these things addressed. 
um, meaning that I would like to make a motion that would continue this item to uh, April 23rd. Uh, so what meeting is that? That's April 23rd. Okay, so for the April 23rd meeting, uh, but that would come back with these things addressed, which would come back with a timeline for renewal of these permits and a cost structure for what that would be. That would come back with uh, something that allows staff to deny applications that have criminal, civil, environmental code or other violations uh, historically or haven't paid taxes. You can use to some of the degree 7.130110H, which is the cannabis as a model, although it's not uh, quite perfect. I would like to see a live work requirement. I'd like to, to make a statement that this is a proactive county investment in an affordable housing type and assuming that that is something that can be done uh, legally. Okay, I, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> we will, we will well, look into it. There may okay. be some conditions, but there are constitutional limitations on that. So when we make investments into affordable housing specifically, we're able to make those requirements, correct? So, so in a Measure J unit, you can make a statement that, that has a live work requirement locally, correct? What would be the fundamental difference then if the county is, is making a proactive statement here in, is it just that I'm, we're not in, investing not in actual included, dollar? Correct, they're not included in the regulatory program and they're not included in an, in an, an affordable housing investment program, so they're treated differently for purposes of constitutional limitations. That's not to say that we couldn't craft something that might address this concern, it's just it may not quite rise to the same level as those deed restricted affordable units are. Understood. I think that the, I appreciate that. Uh, I'll say that it's probably within the board's interest though that we don't have displacement, it's probably within the board's interest that this be addressing an affordable housing need for local residents. I mean, I think that that's a safe statement. So the degree that it can come back uh, with that as well. And I would just like to take a serious look at, and I don't know what the solution is, what that checklist is uh, with the HUD checklist. Some of those conditions to me really aren't something I, I feel comfortable letting our county residents live in still. I don't know where it, it is that uh, that cutoff would occur, but if two or three of those boxes were checked, yes. In my opinion, if one of those boxes were checked, yes, I would be uh, concerned with it. And so I would just like, uh, staff to come back with a with a at least an explanation as to what would cause denial or at a minimum understanding that I think the board's goal here is that we recognize that people are already living in these places. We're not trying to codify people living in substandard conditions. I'm definitely not trying to reward people that have been preying on the vulnerable pop populations in this county with some sort of permit to continue people living in those substandard conditions. So the sunset period or some sort of review period, uh, the checklist component, some element of the live work to the degree that it's possible, and then enumerating ways for denial, including criminal, civil, environmental attacks, violations similar to what is found uh, in that. And I, I don't know if my colleagues will be amenable to this, but I don't think that there should be a short-term rental element in these properties at all. So that's my motion. Uh, I would second the, uh, I support the idea of, uh, of limiting or, 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 or banning the use of short-term rentals. I think that our, our policy goal here is for, for housing. Um, I would also ask for one additional request is that we actually ask information about the, the rental cost because in every five years we would be able to collect that information and know whether our goal is, whether we're, whether we're in the neighborhood on our goal. That's friendly. So. Yeah, that's, this all seems fair. I mean, the devil's gonna be in the details of what actually would be adopted um, at, the next, at the next hearing of those components, but I think having those before us for consideration makes sense. Do you, do you have a comment? Um, no, I mean, I, the only thing I would say regarding the short-term rentals is that may impact the, like wh whether we, some of the current applicants continue on in their process. I understand, I saw that your report actually mentioned that. There were yep. two specific that had mm -hmm. expressed concerns. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, I'll ask all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes four to zero with uh, Supervisor Caput absent. Uh, so now we're gonna move into closed session uh, and I'm gonna ask the uh, County Council if there's anything, gonna be anything reportable? No. Okay, and then uh, we will uh, re-adjourn at 1.30 for a scheduled item, uh, several, four scheduled items uh, for discussion.
afternoon, I'm gonna call the meeting back to order uh, for a 1.30 scheduled item, and this is item number 16, to a uh, public hearing to, reconsider, to consider a resolution uh, approving amendments to the unified fee schedule as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO. And we have our cannabis licensing officer here to present. Sorry. Um, no so the proposed changes to the fee schedule are based on a current conflict we have in our fee schedule with our current code, um, 7.128090G, and um, based on changes to the cannabis um, businesses as we're seeing uh, them evolve. Basically, they're all associated with changes to uh, cannabis events. So we needed to address those changes um, in the unified fee schedule as we do have uh, pending cannabis events that are uh, in the application phase currently. Great. Uh, are there any questions? So with these events at the fairgrounds? Yes. Okay. Um, are there any public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I would move approval for recommended action. We got a motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, post that passes four to zero. Uh, thank you very much. Moving on to item number 17, which is to consider a proposed ordinance amending chapter 7.130 of the Santa Cruz County Code relating to cannabis dispensaries and schedule the ordinance uh, for a second reading and final adoption on April 16, 2019, as outlined in the memorandum of the CAO. Right back uh, to you. This item is a continuation of the item previously proposed on March 26th. Um, there was additional language added uh, for, per the board's um, direction on county signage regulations, and it specifically prohibits the placement of billboards, roadside signs to advertise any aspect of cannabis business, cannabis paraphernalia, cannabis products, um, per the board's direction. So those are the only changes. I can review the remainder of I think I think we remember. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no short-term memory loss here. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions of the board from the board? Are there is is there any public comment? Okay. This is an item that we heard at our last meeting. Was continued to make these changes. I'll bring it back to the board. I appreciate the work that was done. I would move the recommended action. Motion by uh, Leopold, second by Friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes four to zero. Item number 18 is to consider a resolution authorizing the Cannabis Licensing Office to pursue state funds from the Bureau of Cannabis Control for a cannabis equity program as outlined in a memorandum uh, by the CAO. So um, the board resolution proposed is a resolution that's uh, modified text from the BCC which is the Bureau of Cannabis Control. It's the requirements that we have this resolution in place if funding is awarded to us. Um, so it, it is simply based on that, and as the board has already um, previously approved the 7.136, and it was on the consent agenda earlier this morning for final approval. So this is the last last I to cross, or I to dot to, right. for our equity program. Perfect, are there any questions? The belt and suspenders. I, uh, to me. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, any uh, comments from the public? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. I would recommend, uh, uh, I make a motion to, uh, for the recommended changes. Second. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes four to zero. Uh, thank, you thank you for your work and bringing these items forward to us and cleaning up some of these, uh, some of these areas and giving us an opportunity to apply for this st state money. Finally, uh, we're considering item number 19, which is consider an update on the Santa Cruz County Continuous Process Improvement Initiative and, and direct the CAO's office to return no later than August 2019 with information on results of demonstration projects and next steps of the program as outlined in a memorandum by the CAO. To make sure I'm on here. Good, good afternoon, um, Board of Supervisors. Elisa Benson with the uh, County Administrator's Office, and I am the person who's gotten the pleasure of working to bring forward Primo, our Continuous Process Improvement Program here at the County of Santa Cruz. 
We uh, have a, a, a great pre presentation for you today because we're really gonna get to hear from employees. I'm gonna give you a, a quick overview of the program, um, just more for our, our watching public, and then we'll get into what we've been doing in the last six months. So as I mentioned, the purpose today is a six month check-in. We were before this body in early October sharing uh, the, the concept of the program and uh, how we were gonna move forward in this first year to introduce continuous process improvement and in particular lean here at the County of Santa Cruz. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about, our, about our activities between then and now. Um, and then really dive into the demonstration project, which is really the foundation of this first, first years of activities. Uh, we will have four of our 11 demonstration project teams present to you today um, about how it's going, what they're learning, what the experience has been like. And then we'll close with some observations and some questions. And Eric's gonna, who has been our lead on the demonstration project component of the program, will be covering a lot of it. And then we'll turn it to our teams. Uh, very quickly, for our viewing public, um, con continuous process improvement is really a broad workplace philosophy. It's based on incremental change to processes and really empowering employees to do that work as they know the work and the processes best. This is not a new thing. It's been around for 70, 80 years. Uh, and the most current and common uh, method is Lean Six Sigma, and that's what we're utilizing here in the County of Santa Cruz. I just wanna briefly call out what our mission for the program is, and it's really to build a common culture of improvement centered, centered on customers, driven by employees, and focused on measurable outcomes. So that's our vision as we move forward. Uh, then in terms of the program itself and how we put it together in this first year is we w recognize there's a number of objectives. First and foremost, process improvement is not new to this county. It's been done in di different ways and methods by all different organizations. And one of, so there's a real broad range of experience across our departments. So one of our goals is really to create a more common um, language and methods and practice so we really can support each other in doing this and not have it be sort of the exception but more of the rule. We've also tried to balance this with, uh, we have many other critical initiatives going forward. So we've scaled our activities in this first year in a way where we can sort of learn as we go um, and really try and take that learning to and incorporate it into what we will be doing next year. The method to our madness in this first year, we, you've seen the bubble chart before in October. We really saw it as three, three, uh, three components. Um, demonstration projects, which will really be the focus today, but as well as leadership and practitioner training. And I, could, I was talking to Eric about potentially changing this figure so <laughs> the bubbles got smaller and sort of absorbed into the demonstration projects. That's sort of what our experience has led to in the last six months. And the other thing is consistent communication, really trying to share our learning across all departments and staff. We're not able to st you know, do this everywhere all at once, but we do want to make it accessible so people can watch our progress and um, and see how things are going. And we are making small changes along the way since October. Prior to our official rollout, and this really came out of direction from our meeting back in October, um, you all said to the team, you need to get out and have more contact with our frontline staff about this. Uh, a lot of work had been done at the department leadership level, but we had not really had the opportunity to reach out and hear from the folks who should be doing this work. So we did have five mixers, employee mixers, from mid-November into mid-December across the county. About 150 different employees um, came. It was, it was a pretty fun event. Um, Eric stood on a chair as part of our... our getting people excited. We did uh, a lot, some exercises showing people how straightforward actually process improvement is. Had a lot of um, group dialogue and small table work to talk about concerns about how we move the program forward, you know, what people's fears, what, they're, what they were interested in. I mean, that really started driving more how we wanted to put the training together and, and know what to anticipate along the way. So 
I can say that we have staff that are very interested, but there also there's a level of, of skepticism too. Is this, you know, the flavor of the week uh, type program? And I think what it, that's why us being able to communicate broadly about our, our prog progress on our projects is important so we can show that we can be disciplined, stick to it, and support the projects from start to finish. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to first point out that I was standing on chairs before Beto O'Rourke made it cool. <laughs> um, and I'm sure there was the appropriate uh, uh, risk manager there right. to make sure it was totally safe. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, back in, uh, in October when we first came to you, uh, we had an intention of setting up a program that categorized the different types of demonstration projects into various categories based on complexity and size. Um, and then supply uh, training to each of those different categories, you know, based on the appropriate need. And one of the major pivots that we had in the program as we're kind of learning as we're doing here was that we realized that a better approach was actually to take core team members from each team, regardless of complexity or size, and offer them all the same intermediate level training. Um, basically, effectively, as Lisa pointed to earlier, uh, combining our training program and our demonstration projects really into one broader thing. When that broader thing we tend to refer to as building operational capacity. So what is building operational capacity? Well, it started with a uh, champion training, which we invited our department leaders uh, to participate in a one-day seminar where um, they really got to engage in the material and learn how to lead in a lean environment, um, how to be a project champion, how to set guidelines and give grant authority to employees to go ahead and make changes within their departments, um, how to uh, effectively evaluate a project charter, um, how to ask the appropriate questions when a project team um, is at a certain phase of uh, working on their improvements. Uh, from there, we pivoted towards our Greenbelt training. And Greenbelt sounds a little odd, so I'll explain what that means, what that is first. And uh, Lean Six Sigma borrows its nomenclature on its different levels of training, uh, similar to uh, martial arts and the nomenclature there. So everyone's somewhat familiar with that, where white belt is pretty basic, very, uh, very beginner. You move up to a yellow belt, you learn a little bit more, gain a little more skills, a few more tools. You go over to a green belt, that's really an intermediate level where you've really introduced to all the tools. You begin to learn how to lead um, and how to apply them in real world situations, and then on and on all the way up to a, a master black belt. So in our green belt training, um, it's an intensive eight days of training over three months. Um, it's all day, eight days. Uh, the trainees, um, all of them must work on their demonstration projects while they're in the class. So it's a learning by doing model. And that's how we felt that is the best way to support these demonstration projects. So trainees, uh, these core team members will come in, they learn the material, they apply them directly to their projects, and then take that material back to their broader project teams and work on the projects even further, disseminating that information to the whole project team. Um, with that, we felt that this uh, creates sort of a decentralized resource um, within uh, the county that leads to helping uh, Greenbelts become really uh, leaders, consultants, and supporters of projects within their organizations and within their departments. It's our vision really to have green belts really out in, in the field and be able to be resources for when someone comes up, comes up and says, I really have an idea to make this improvement. Well, that green belt is there to support them, help them get them organized and get the project rolling to make that improvement happen. So with that, I'd like to introduce our 2019 Green Belt cohort. There's 27 of them. Uh, many of them are here in the audience today. Um, not everyone can make it, um, but this is a, a wide range of folks um, throughout the entire county. And the projects that they're working on are also a wide range, of, a whole menu of, of um, topics that they're beginning to tackle. Everything from our agenda management system and how we're putting together the packet that you all interact with every two weeks um, to how we process our Metacruise payments. We also have uh, projects related to how our ISD system works, um, as well as um, how our maintenance crews are deployed within our GSD uh, division. I wanted to add one thing. Can you go back to the uh, two slides back? I do want to make sure we, we cover, in terms of where we are in the Greenbelt training, uh, the cohort has gone through six of the eight days, and really right now, they're going to get into this a little bit as we move forward, there's a defi very defined methodology within and curriculum within the Greenbelt training, and they are in the define and measure, measure phase. Measure phase. So it's, it, I would describe it, we're in the first third 
of the curriculum and, and the methodology that we're, we're working, working through. So when our teams come forward, I want to, wanted to just have you all be aware that we're in the, we're in the beginning part of this process. Um, folks are, I wouldn't even say halfway through. So um, just wanted to make sure we, we, they're not at the end of their projects yet and we definitely plan to come back and share more when we get through that. Right. Before I, we get too much farther ahead in, uh, in all the different projects that we'll be talking about today, we want to talk a little bit about Primo Pi. Um, uh, Pi stands for a permitting improvement effort, and this was a, an intensive uh, five-day effort where employees from the planning department, public works, and environmental health all got together in a room about half the size of this chambers uh, for five days, and they mapped the entire permitting process. Not a single square foot of wall was not untouched in putting together um, that entire map. Uh, when they mapped out this process, they, automatic they automatically they found 80 potential improvements ranging from quick fixes to policy changes that would need to be implemented over several years, um, right off the bat. Uh, one interesting stat um, with a certain margin of error, uh, they found that only 2% of applications are successfully obtain a permit on their first try, meaning 98% of the time an applicant has to, at some point in the process, redo some work. Um, with all of this information, uh, the group has spun off into two groups, tackling two of the, the most obvious and main issues. Um, the first is around initial application intakes and the routing of those applications. And the second is the how do we optimally use the technology tools that are available to us um, to make routing a little easier. Uh, so with that, I will bring up uh, our first group to, to talk about the first half of, of our Primo Pi effort. Um, as they come up, they'll talk a lot about some of the tools that they're using, where they're at in their methodology and their, in their process for finding these improvements, um, and how they, uh, the whole program has gone for them so far. So I'll invite our Route to Success team up first. All right. Good afternoon, my name is Jocelyn Drake and I'm a principal planner in the development review division of the planning department. Um, I am one of the staff members who participated in the Primo Pi um, mapping exercise that Eric just uh, referenced where um, a number of staff were brought together for a week to map the building and the discretionary permit process from the very beginning to the very end of the process. And we did, it was very revealing as Eric mentioned that we found that uh, about 2% of our building permits actually um, are deemed complete upon first routing. And our success rate for discretionary permits is not far behind that. Um, and that's due to a variety of reasons. Um, so uh, moving forward into the green belt training, I was also selected for that obviously. And my team decided to tackle a piece of that um, overall process, which is first routings. Um, so our, um, our group, the Route to Success group, um, decided to um, work on uh, better completeness, um, increased completeness on first routing for building uh, discretionary permits, as well as streamlining our review process in that first routing. Um, we found through the Kaizen Primo Pi process, as well as just in discussion with um, our fellow staff members, that incomplete submittals impact the agency's internal customers, which is us, staff, um, in that, um, Incomplete submittals result in additional application routings, a backlog in agency staff reviews, lost revenue, and reduction in overall staff work capacity. Um, and also the incomplete uh, submittals um, impact our external customers, applicants, and property owners um, in that um, additional routings result in delays in permit issuance, delays in construction timelines, and increased permit costs. So this is definitely something we felt we should address if we can through our project. So um, moving forward into our Greenbelt um, session, um, we learned a variety of tools um, in, as part of the first part of the Greenbelt training that um, they mentioned here um, to assist us in reining in the scope of our project, analyzing that project, um, gathering data, and hopefully seeing it through the end. We haven't finished the last two days, but that's what I anticipate we're gonna do. Um, the first thing that we did was we, um, through uh, utilizing one of the tools, we decided to 
do a more detailed swim lane map, which is what you're seeing here, um, where we looked at every single um, piece of the first writing process, um, how many people touch that application, how long it sits um, in someone's inbox, um, and um, and some of the, the loops that, that an application is, is, is gets caught up in. Sometimes you can kind of see the, the, the the lines going around, looping around there. And, and it was really eye-opening for us to, to see this map and to um, see where, um, where there were delays in our process. And we began to identify ways that we could streamline the process. And we have some ideas about um, how to tackle this. But um, so we're working on those now. And I will hand it over to Carolyn. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Carolyn Burke, and I'm with the Environmental Planning Section of the Planning Department, and I'm also a core team member for this project, and participated in the Primo Pi event, and am going to the Greenbelt trainings. So um, you'll see up on the slide, it talks about the DMAIC process, which is a data-driven strategy for improving processes, and it's fundamental to the Six Sigma program. The acronym, acronym stands for the phases of process improvement, which are define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. As Jocelyn noted, we've completed the define phase of our project, concluding in the development of our project charter, which she just covered. We're currently in the measure phase of the project, and as has been discussed widely, the overall success rates for the first routing building permit applications is around 2%. We're currently compiling success rate for individual reviewing agencies to prioritize our efforts. During our most recent Greenbelt training, we determined it was necessary to form two separate groups to focus on discretionary and building permit review processes separately as they had different needs. We anticipate there may be further phasing required as we gain a, gather additional data and complete our Greenbelt trainings. And move on. Um, so integrating continuous improvement in our department poses challenges as well as opportunities. While we're faced with the usual challenge of finding staff time to take on new duties, a major um, challenge we anticipate is rallying the support of stakeholders participating in the permit application process. One outcome of this project will be a um, clear, concise, and streamlined list of requirements for incoming applications, but the, the impact of this on routing success will require that line staff, managers, and supervisors are aligned in maintaining these minimum standards. We're addressing these challenges by improving communication within the department and including ongoing communication efforts between planning department staff, consulting communities, and county staff outside our department within the scope of our project. So I'll, I'm, I'm emceeing over here. So I'll I invite up our next uh, second half of our PI team, which is our uh, permit improvement, technology improvement team. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Bob Colosino. I'm building counter supervisor for the planning department. And our team is working on technology improvements to our current permit processing. Um, some other team members are on the team also are Amy Wilbanks, Amy Mayakusa, Michael Sotero, Nathan Macbeth, Lonnie Garcia, and Olga Zuniga. Um, part of our goal is to, well, our process is fairly complex because of this technology and there's so many aspects of it. So we actually broke our project into three phases. Uh, the first phase is to review the current permit processes and to identify technology enhancements and any training needs that may be needed to help reduce the review times. We expect that process to be done before August, by the end, no later than the end of August. Um, and our second phase would include to provide training, not only to current staff, but also outreach and training to our clients, which is the public. Um, and our third phase would be also to review our existing website for any possible enhancement to help the public as well. Um, we're, after we started going through all this, we're looking at possibly phase two and phase three to run parallel because our team is fairly large enough. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, in the DMAIC process, as Carolyn stated, it's define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. At this time, we are actually in the analyze phase, and we are begin to schedule our uh, Gemba walks, which is 
um, which each department, we're going to walk through each department, whether it is whether department head and or um, a staff member as well, to find out what existing technology they are using, whether they're using it to its fullest, and whether they need additional training to help them make their um, jobs quicker and speedier. Uh, this will also help us to find some current um, manual and or paper methods that we're using right now that could be pushed into a technology phase that could speed things up. One example is that we send out correction letters and approval letters, which go through snail mail. We print, you know, 100 out plus a week. Um, it takes a week to get to the client. The client then has time time to get back to us. We're trying to make that just an online process so they can just look at it immediately and it's just speed things up quickly that way. Um, and we've also started and have done um, specific, pulled specific data from our online permit processing to help us um, analyze where the pinch points and delays are in our process as well. Um, the tools um, we learned through not only the Primo Pi, which I was part of as well, but also in our Greenbelt. We've learned many tools and all of them are just phenomenal. A uh, couple of them, which was also one of them specifically that has been a help for us is the swim lane map. We actually took the process from the point where a client comes into the GID staff, which is that round desk up front um, on the third floor, till it comes to the building permit text, and then as it goes through the entire building process and touches every department that needs to see it. So that's part of our walks, and we're going to be doing analyzing all that. Um, um, and this process, again, will confirm where all the delays are in the pinch points. During our Primo Pi, um, we also came up with, as Eric st uh, stated, some quick fixes. And one of them that has been already implemented by our um, building super, our uh, CBO is Marty Haney, um, is some video instructions to go along with our user guide for our e-plan. And we've had some clients have difficulty um, trying to figure out the user manual, and so we've already started implementing some video guides. And we also have a YouTube website for that, and we will be continuing to add video instruction to that, not only for the public, but also for internal staff as well. And Michael Sotero, which is on our team, he's already been doing that, and he's gonna be adding more and more as we go on. Um, last one. Um, lastly, um, our team is extremely excited to help make some positive changes that will benefit our coworkers as well as the public who are our clients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and, and uh, bring up our GSD team to talk about mobile work order management. Hey, good day, supervisors. I'm Jacqueline Church, the analyst at General Services, and I have my Greenbelt partner, Shannon Gannon, who's part of our work te uh, maintenance team. And um, our project has been um, with the change in technology, we are getting a new um, work order management system, and um, so we're gonna also have a mobile capability with that, and we're gonna launch iPads out with our work team um, in order to ease the flow of our work management with regards to repairs or maintenance of our buildings around the county. And what we've been doing differently with um, our project is um, we've started by, part of our staff is out in the field, our custodians, our work team, our fleet management. So we've been trying to utilize our project and what we've been learning in the green belt um, to disseminate that information to our, our team within general services as far as understanding the lingo and language and how to get involved in our projects moving forward, what will um, come about and showcase our um, progress through having an internal web page. We've added our Primo section. And then we've also created um, posters for those areas where staff are, that they can understand the language and see this every day you know, in their break rooms and say, oh, I have a great idea that I would just wanna make a change today and improve something within our department. Um, and so in anal analyzing our um, data in our work management system. We've had that for the last two years, and we've entered over 7,000 um, work orders. And that ranges anything from hanging artwork or moving furniture to the remodels and the bigger projects that take a little longer, you know, to work through. And so part of, you know, the interesting side of that is just understanding um, with the mobile capability, how we'll be able to streamline and um, be assigning 
tasks to our workers out in the field quicker and make that easier. And so Shannon's gonna go ahead and discuss a little bit more about the work side of it. So in conjunction, in conjunction with the paperless platform, each crew member will get a tablet that they'll have in the field and they'll be able to receive work orders on a immediate basis. So let's say a, a worker goes to South County, he's down there and he's working on a bunch of projects. Well, he gets one immediately that he can do while he's there. He doesn't have to travel back to the shop, pick it up and go back. So we're saving a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources. We're also working on a two team system right now, which we're gonna divide our team into two separate teams. One will be an emergency response team that will handle emergencies and top priority work orders. The second team will do daily work orders and preventative maintenance, which is something that in the county we've been show, so short staffed that we just haven't had time to adequately address that issue. So this will enable us to do that. So between the paperless project and the two team workforce, I believe that we're gonna see major cost reductions. One of those will be we won't have to put things out to subcontractors that typically charge a little bit more than they would if they didn't know it was extremely necessary for us. Uh, and I'd also like to add that the Greenbelt training has been instrumental in helping us move forward with new ideas and solutions for maintaining our ever aging buildings. Thank you for your time. Uh, next up, we're gonna uh, invite um, our team from Behavioral Health to talk about children's access and crisis service responses. Good afternoon, my name is Cassandra Aslami and I'm the Director of South County Behavioral Health Services. Thank you for having me this afternoon. And I wanted to start this afternoon by sharing a story with you that highlights our problem that's currently happening with access services for children's behavioral health. So please imagine your mom working in South County and you take public transit every day to your job from about eight to five doing janitorial services. You lost your husband about a year ago, but you have a 14-year-old son. You recently noticed that your 14-year-old son's been isolating quite a bit. He also isn't coming out of, his, out of his room as much and seems to be sleeping a lot less. You decide that you wanna call County Behavioral Health Services and find out if you can get mental health services for your son. So you borrow someone's phone at work and you call during business hours. When you call the access line, they let you know that they're gonna to need to give you a call back to schedule the appointment. They also have walk-in services for children, but those services are in North County. So you hang up and you feel a little unclear on what to do next. You're not exactly sure how you're gonna get services for your son. So I tell you this story to highlight pain points and weaknesses in our current children's access service model. We can speculate what happens to children in these situations that they often wait until they re reach crisis mode where they then seek high cost services that actually fragment family systems and create current stressors in the home environment. So we are very, very excited to embark on Primo and to take CPI and the tools that we're learning to look at waste and inefficiencies within our behavioral health system. We wanna create parity with North County and also equitable access for South County families. We know that 72% of children in the behavioral health system live between Mid and South County. So by incorporating these CPI tools and, and skills, we're actually gonna be able to create a better access system for these families. This is perfect timing for us with the new behavioral health office building, which is opening this spring and provides us with increased staffing patterns and also increased facilities where we can provide same day and next day psychosocial assessments and medication management for our South County consumers and families. So we currently are in the DMAIC stage of DEFINE. We've had one meeting so far with our behavioral health CPI team. And at that meeting, we really focused on orienting the behavioral health team to the CPI tools by having all of our participants, participants complete the white belt training. We also had a very thoughtful conversation about what the status quo is surrounding current access models and why we do what we currently do. What are our opportunities for change? And also had conversation about uh, potential early improvements that we can make early on. Our next meeting, we're gonna do a swim lane mapping where we're really gonna dissect the access delivery system to figure out exactly where these pain points are for our consumers and how we can better meet the needs of our community. 
We are very excited about CPI and behavioral health. We see this as an opportunity for a lot of uh, change because we are given the skills and the tools to invest in improvement. We can see how this can create a reduction of wait times for consumers across all of behavioral health systems, not just children's behavioral health. In addition, this also provides us with the opportunity to look at psychiatry and how we can provide treatment on demand with same day and next day medication services. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, last but certainly not least, um, from our personnel department, we'll have a team talking about um, uh, time to establish an eligibility list. Good afternoon, I'm Nisha Patel, Employment Services Manager, and I'm here with my colleagues this afternoon to talk about the Personnel Department Project, which is to review the time it takes to establish an eligibility list. While we initially started off looking at a much wider scope of this project, which included uh, looking at the operating departments from the moment that they have the vacancy through the time that we have someone in the seat, through our Greenbelt training, we have narrowed our scope to simply looking at the parts that we are directly involved with. This is not to say that we're going to lose sight of the beginning and the end process because we'll be able to obtain that through the voice of the customer. Through our project charter, we have identified the problem statement to be that operating departments are unable to fill positions quickly to better serve customers and the community. Our goal through this project is to decrease the average time it takes to establish the eligibility list by July of 2019. By reducing the time, it will help understaffed departments offer more effective and efficient services to our community, and it will position the county as an employer of choice to applicants. And now I turn it over to Luna to share some of the tools that we've been using. Good afternoon, my name is Luna Harder. I'm a personnel technician in the Employment Services Division. And we have used all of the tools that are listed on the PowerPoint slide, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them. So first I'd like to highlight the parking lot tool, which we've used as a repository for ideas that, we, that our team has come up with throughout the define, measure, and analyze phase. And we're going to implement some of those ideas during the improve phase. Uh, I would also like to highlight the swim lane. Did we get the next slide? So this is a photo of our detailed swim lane, which uh, consi consisted of our entire employment services division getting into one room and really discussing every single step in our recruitment process. We identified that there are over 100 steps in our process. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Moore. I'm the County Training Analyst, and I wanted to share some of our team's impressions of uh, the project and of our Greenbelt training. Um, the ability to use tools to facilitate culture and process change is definitely a positive. Um, we recognize that getting staff who do the work involved in the process is one of the key pieces, and um, without their ownership, we wouldn't have success in this. Um, and through this practice, we have been basically educating and communicating with our entire department about what our process is. You know, we're getting out there and doing these gumbo walks where there's seven of us, you know, walking around with clipboards. So it's really important to bring the, the entire division and the, t and the entire personnel division um, into this and letting them understand. This has increased or sort of um, incited some excitement around continuous process improvement projects and a shift in culture, which is so important to the success and the adaptation of CPI. Um, we also recognize that without support of the champions and the executive leadership, that this wouldn't be possible. So we would like to thank you, the board, um, the CAO's office, and our director, Ajita Patel, for your leadership and support. And we're looking forward to seeing our project through. Thank you. Yeah. So that was really um, just a tip of the iceberg of, of some of the work that's being done um, to improve processes throughout the county. Um, stepping back, the, the Primo program is going to continue to learn as we go. I'm sure there's other corners we haven't seen around yet, so there may be uh, more shifts to the, to the, uh, to the program. Um, that includes some shifts in how we're communicating. And we've set up some programs early on around our communication strategy that we may need to be shifting around in, in the coming months. 
Um, really the ethos around the, the program um, will continue though, which is to invest and support in people and the projects and the ideas that they have will come. Um, we always want to keep an eye on making sure that the program is manageable, manageable and given the resources we have available and right now it's all about building operational capacity. And uh, with that, uh, we are happy to take um, any questions. Sure. I guess I'll just start by saying um, it's really exciting to see you all here and to hear these projects that are concrete and engaging and you know, um, you all are invaluable because you have the skills and the knowledge and the understanding, uh, but most importantly, you have the trust of your coworkers to be able to make all this, to make these changes happen and to really map these things out. And so uh, it's really exciting and I, I really appreciate all your efforts in doing this. I think from the board's perspective, one of the things that we can offer um, is that perhaps in the past, uh, other boards uh, haven't, uh, rewarded risk taking uh, and maybe even punish folks who uh, who make mistakes and that this board I think wants to make clear that we want you to take risks and try new things and we understand that some of those things might not work and if they don't work we'll defend you uh, for trying new things and trying to learn from what's going on um, and so make sure you're taking risks and the other part of it is and I think this happens probably a lot in planning and other departments where there's one instance uh, out of hundreds that causes some problems and we create an entirely new process or step to deal with that one outlier. Uh, and so to the extent that you can get rid of those unnecessary processes for the 0.01% of time uh, that, are, that are then holding up the 99% of people who are, who are trying to go through the process, make sure you uh, communicate to us uh, if we have a role to play in that uh, so that we can try to get you know, common sense and just clear processes going and not just building a lot of rules for the, for the outlier situations. Zach, Supervisor Brennan. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I wanted to echo something Ryan said and actually add something to this, which is to say that when we meet, when we often meet with employee groups or individual employees or even department heads, and we hear a lot about things that people want to do differently, and I think that people haven't necessarily felt like they've been given the space to do things differently. Uh, and we want to ensure that our role and the executive role here is that you are given that space to do it because. There's no way we can have the, the level of understanding at the granular level that, that all of you have. As a result of that, there's no way that we, even though we'll hear challenges from the community or hear challenges from employees, we don't necessarily know what the best solution to that is, and we have to put full faith in you to provide us with that, that information. And, and I think that what was really, uh, what was really uplifting today to hear was, was how much this seems to be invigorating at the line level of people's interest in, in doing their positions. And also remember, the things that you're frustrated with uh, were because before you they weren't changed. You have a significant responsibility to ensure that moving forward that that's not then the same thing for the next set of people who come after you. We, we can change it. Um, there was somebody who gave me advice that has stuck with me about uh, when I used to work in my old position at the police department and we were in police management, it was the sense of, they would always blame them, you know, the management or the other people. Well, now that's all you, right? So there, there's no, there is no them. Uh, we are them, and we have a responsibility then to make those modifications, not just for us, but for other people that will come after us. And there's rapid changes right now in technology and expectations of the community interaction with all of us. Uh, and we're the front line with it. So it's exciting to me, but also it's, there's a significant responsibility here that I want to make sure that we're all taking seriously. We have the ability uh, to make this a better place for people to live and to work if we choose to do it. And it sounds like all of you are taking remarkable ownership on it. I'm proud of you. I know the board's proud of the work that you're doing. And we're actually even more excited to see what happens at, at the end of this because it'll make it just a better place all around. So thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Uh, uh, well, first, I want to thank everyone for, for made the presentation. You are people that we don't actually get a chance to see that often here before the board. And so it's, it's refreshing to hear some new voices talk about um, the process change within our departments. And I want to acknowledge that and, and thank you for your presentations. And, you know, as I look at this list, this is, uh, um, th with maybe one exception, these are things that are really important, but sometimes don't rise to the level of the Board of Supervisors. 
right? I mean, and you know, the, whether it be um, uh, the uh, establishing eligibility lists, um, even the children's mental health uh, responses piece doesn't always re reach the level. It doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, and it, sh it shouldn't be perceived that the board has not been wanting to change anything. I give credit to our CAO and the executive team who's wanted to um, challenge us all to take a look at the way we do things, uh, to do things differently rather than just doing it the way we do it because we've done it that way for so long. And to, to do things differently is, um, is both really exciting and slightly terrifying because we've all gotten used to doing things a certain way and you have to, it's a, when I heard people talk about the culture change, I believe that that's, that's a real part of this to think about doing things differently. Um, also in just uh, realizing the new language that you have to have, I, when I was, as you were making these presentation, I thought about all the new acronyms that I have to learn. Primo, <laughs> Pi, DMAG, Jemba, Sigma, I didn't even know what SIPOC was. I don't. <laughs> uh, but I appreciate that 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 it's all part of a process. And when 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 the uh, the swim lane mapping looked fascinating uh, to me to understand that, and that's um, deep into the weeds of what you do, right? And uh, you you know it best. You're the front line on these uh, projects, and. Uh, it looked like there was great consistency in the way that those mapping were made. And I guess the question I have is, is there a facilitator who's helping with those, m with those mapping sessions or have been people trained to do the mapping themselves? Uh, <coughs> the answer is both. Um, we, uh, as a Greenbelt uh, team came together, um, we have a, um, a consultant on board who's helping uh, lead that training effort. And in that, in that training, uh, we've all learned uh, how to do these swim lane maps. And then uh, as uh, project teams have gone back with their broader teams to talk about their, their projects, they've gone ahead and done the swim lane, swim lane maps themselves. The exception to that is during the Primo Pi effort. There was a facilitator helping kind of guide that whole team along because that was actually our first go at it. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, well, it looked like a fascinating process. It would be interesting for the five of us one day and look about how we get an item on the board. I know we have an agenda <laughs> management system. I'm yeah. sure someone is mapping <laughs> that out. I, I just, uh, you know, one of the things when, uh, as we went into the uh, Great Recession, we tried to figure out as a board what we could do to protect frontline services because we know that you're the, really the face to the public. You're the ones they see. They, they hold us responsible, but it's you who the, the, the public counts on uh, in a lot of ways to do the work. And so your interest and leadership uh, skills to be able to take this on and reconfigure uh, something so it works better, that it's more effective for the people who interact with the county, um, that, will, uh, that, that will maybe even be less expensive and more effective, that's a great package uh, for us, and it'll make all of our lives actually easier because if the pr if someone can get their permit uh, out uh, quicker, that's a guaranteed, you know, they love the county then. Um, if it sits in there for six weeks, it drives them, you know, drives them totally nuts. So I appreciate the work that you, you have, that you're taking on, and I, I, when my colleague talked about taking risks, there are things that we might try that, y that you might suggest that we find out doesn't work. You find out as you, as you do it. And we have to be accepting of that. So we, we're, we are asking you to come up with these and we realize that some of them might be a little clunky as, as you fine tune. So that's gonna be on us to, to back you up. Uh, but you are the leaders here uh, and I really appreciate you taking the time and effort to present it to us and the time you're putting in to help making these changes in our systems here at the county, so thank you. Yeah, I, I repeat all the uh, comments that have been made. I'm really excited about this because uh, I think you're putting a new face uh, on the county, really, and how we operate. Uh, this in progress, progress report is very encouraging to me. I think it's uh, really exciting. I hope that you're as excited as really we are. You know, as government, we make policy, and some people think we make it as difficult as possible, but that's not true. We try to make it as simple as we can, and it's, uh, th there's a lot of, lot of uh, input that goes into what we do in policy, and you see it front line. 
and you have, I think you have a better idea of how we should do things in the future than, than we do up here. Um, because, um, you know, just because we've been doing it for years, it doesn't mean it's the, been the right way. Um, I, one quick, you know, for when I was kind of concerned, but, you know, about, about the only 2% get through the, the process in the first try, I doubt that you can expect many to get through in the first try, but when you have like, when you see what that's what's happening, do you set a goal that would be a realistic goal that, I don't know, 20% should get th through in the first try or something? Uh, how do you gauge that? Or do you try to gauge that, that, hey, this is where we are, this is what we should do as a goal? Do you set goals right away? Or is that, is that part of the process? Yeah, part of the process is, um, you know, developing a project charter and, and within that, doc, which is a one-page document which kind of outlines your entire project, and one section of that is talking about uh, the goals for your project. What do you expect to see happen? And, and a lot of that comes down to the analysis that you're, the preliminary analysis that you're doing when you're looking at That's the process. That's the third part, the DMIAC, DMIAC or whatever it was <laughs> called, or whatever? Yeah, DMIAC. part of the DMIAC process, DMIAC. yeah. Um, and, and then what's interesting, though, about a project charter is it's also a living documents so as you begin to measure certain things like the 2% success rate and like other uh, other metrics that may be involved in your process you may be changing you know what you expect a goal so you might set a goal for 20% improvement um, and then only go back after you found some more data to realize oh maybe it needs to be 15% mm -hmm. um, so it, there's constant time uh, fine-tuning it's continuous process <laughs> improvement so um, that's really um, kind of the the elegance uh, of the whole program yeah, I, I think that we're in the the job of public service, uh, and the way you you want to see how we improve uh, our methods of, of serving the public is very impressive. I, I'm really excited to look at what you've tackled so far. Uh, thank for the CAO, Carlos Palacios, and the, uh, everybody who's been uh, participating in this. Um, believe me, we're listening, and I really appreciate what you've done to this point. It's very impressive. Um, I really, I'm just absolutely all in that we're in the head, you are headed in the right direction to help us uh, make policy for the people of Santa Cruz County, so thank you very much. <coughs> Carlos, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, tell the staff that I'm just so proud of you. This is just an amazing moment for all of us to see um, the progress you've made and the effort you've made. Um, and taking uh, your responsibility for the public so seriously, it just really, really makes us all proud and makes me very proud to see how much you're growing and seeing how much you care and how much effort you've put into this. So thank you very much. I really do thank each one of you because in the end, um, it will be, it is about the public, right? And, and the public will benefit from this. And this is the way to do change. It is not, um, I've learned over a long career <laughs> that uh, it's a mistake generally to bring in outside consultant and spend half a million dollars and say, have them deliver and say, here's how you should improve your planning or here's how you should improve your personnel. Uh, because the experts are right there. They're the experts. And, um, and that, this is the way to, um, to do change. And then the other thing about it is that it's really important that this is gonna become uh, a part of our culture and it's not gonna be something that we just start and then end. This is how we are gonna do business. It's going to be um, where we have lots of green belts all over, lots of black belts, and it'll just be part of how we do business because things are always changing, technology's changing, um, regulations are changing, uh, and we just uh, are going to continue to adapt to that and get better at it. And so it really is something about a cultural change. And I want to thank uh, all of our staff, and especially um, Alisa and Eric and the other leaders who've done so much, so much good work on this. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I don't believe any action was taken other than um, our sincere appreciation and desire to hear how things go uh, in all your projects and what we can do to support you as you move forward. Um, <coughs> don't hesitate to, to come. You don't have to come to a board meeting. Just come up and knock on our doors uh, and let us know. We're, we'd love to hear more. So uh, thank you for this effort. Um, and with that, I'm going to adjourn to our next re regularly scheduled meeting of uh, April 16th. Thank you.